Chapter Twenty One of the Return of Doctor Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Doctor Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty One. Craigmire Tower. Less than two hours later, Inspector Weymouth and a party of men from Scotland Yard raided the house in Museum Street. They found the stock of J. Salomon practically intact, and, in the strangely appointed rooms above, every evidence of a hasty outgoing. But of the instruments, drugs, and other laboratory paraphernalia, not one item remained. I would gladly have given my income for a year to have gained possession of the books alone, for, beyond all shadow of doubt, I knew them to contain formula calculated to revolutionize the science of medicine. Exhausted physically and mentally, and with my mind a whispering gallery of conjectures, it were needless for me to mention whom respecting, I turned in gratefully, having patched up the slight wound in my calf. I seemed scarcely to have closed my eyes when Nayland Smith was shaking me into wakefulness. "'You are probably tired out,' he said, "'but your crazy expedition of last night entitles you to no sympathy. "'Read this. There is a train in an hour. "'We will reserve a compartment, and you can resume your interrupted slumbers in a corner seat.' "'As I struggled upright in bed, rubbing my eyes sleepily, "'Smith handed me the daily telegraph, pointing to the following paragraph upon the literary page. "'Messrs. M. announced that they will publish shortly the long-delayed works of Keegan von Roon, "'the celebrated American traveller orientalist and psychic investigator dealing with his recent inquiries in china it will be remembered that mr van roon undertook to motor from canton to siberia last winter but met with unforeseen difficulties in the province of honan he fell into the hands of a body of fanatics and was fortunate to escape with his life his book will deal in particular with his experiences in honan and some sensational revelations regarding the awakening of that most mysterious race the chinese are promised for reasons of his own, he has decided to remain in England until the completion of his book, which will be published simultaneously in New York and London, and has leased Cragmire Tower, Somersetshire, in which romantic and historical residence he will collate his notes and prepare for the world a work earmarked as a classic, even before it is published. I glanced up from the paper to find Smith's eyes fixed upon me inquiringly. From what I have been able to learn— he said evenly, we should reach Seoul with a decent luck, just before dusk. As he turned and quitted the room without another word, I realized in a flash the purport of our mission. I understood my friend's ominous calm, betoking suppressed excitement. The fates were with us, or so it seemed, and whereas we had not hoped to gain Seoul before sunset, as a matter of fact the autumn afternoon was in its most glorious phase as we left the little village with its old-time hostelry behind us, and set out in an easterly direction, with the Bristol Channel far away on our left, and a gently sloping upland on our right. The crooked high street practically constituted the entire hamlet of Seoul, and the inn, the wagoners, was the last house in the street. Now, as we followed the ribbon of Moor Path to the top of the rise, we could stand and look back upon the way we had come, and although we had covered fully a mile of ground, it was possible to detect the sunlight gleaming now and then upon the gilt lettering of the inn sign as it swayed in the breeze. The day had been unpleasantly warm, but was relieved by this same sea breeze, which, although but slight, had in it the tang of the broad Atlantic. Behind us, then, the footpath sloped down to Saul, unpeopled by any living thing, East and northeast swelled the monotony of the moor right out to the hazy distance where the sky began and the sea remotely lay hidden. West fell the gentle gradient from the top of the slope which we had mounted, and here, as far as the eye could reach, the country had an appearance suggested of a huge and dried-up lake. This idea was borne out by an odd blotchiness, for sometimes there would be half a mile or more of seeming moorland, then a sharply defined change— or so it seemed sharply defined from that bird's-eye point of view. A vivid greenness marked these changes, which merged into a dun-coloured smudge, and again into the brilliant green, then the moor would begin once more. "'That'll be tour of Glastonbury, I suppose,' said Smith, suddenly peering through his field-glasses in an easterly direction. "'And yonder, unless I'm greatly mistaken, is a Cragmire Tower.' Shading my eyes with my hand, I also looked ahead and saw the place for which we were bound, one of those round towers more common in Ireland, which some authorities have declared to be of Phoenician origin. 
ramshackle buildings clustered untidily about its base and to it a sort of tongue of that oddly venomous green which patched the lowlands shot out and seemed almost to reach the tower base the land for miles around was as flat as the palm of my hand saving certain hummocks lesser tors and irregular piles of boulders which dotted its expanse hills and uplands there were in the hazy distance forming a sort of mighty inland bay which i doubted not in some past age had been covered by the sea even in the brilliant sunlight the place had something of a mournful aspect looking like a great dried-up pool into which the children of giants had carelessly cast stones we met no living soul upon the moor with the cragmire tower but a quarter of a mile off smith paused again and raising his powerful glasses swept the visible landscape not a sign petrie he said softly yet dropping the glasses back into their case my companion began to tug at his left ear have we been overconfident he said narrowing his eyes in that speculative fashion no less than three times i have had the idea that something or some one has just dropped out of sight behind me as i focused what do you mean smith are we he glanced about him as though the vastness were peopled with listening chinamen followed silently we looked into each other's eyes each seeking for the dread which neither had named then come on petrie said smith grasping my arm and at quick march we were off again cragmire tower stood upon a very slight eminence and what had looked like a green tongue from the moorland slopes above was in fact a creek flanked by lush land which here found its way to the sea the house which we were come to visit consisted in a low two-storey building joining the ancient tower on the east with two smaller outbuildings there was a miniature kitchen garden and a few stunted fruit trees in the northwest corner the whole being surrounded by a grey stone wall the shadow of the tower fell sharply across the path which ran up almost alongside of it we were both extremely warm by reason of our long and rapid walk on that hot day and this shade should have been grateful to us in short i find it difficult to account for the unwelcome chill which i experienced at the moment that i found myself at the foot of the time-worn monument i know that we both pulled up sharply and looked at one another as though acted upon by some mutual disturbance but not a sound broke the stillness save a remote murmuring until a solitary seagull rose in the air and circled directly over the tower uttering its mournful and unmusical cry automatically to my mind sprang the lines of the poem far from all brother men in the weird of the fen with god's creatures i bide mid the birds that i ken where the winds ever dree where the hymn of the sea brings a message of peace from the ocean to me not a soul was visible about the premises there was no sound of human activity and no dog barked nayland smith drew a long breath glanced back along the way we had come then went on following the wall i beside him until we came to the gate it was unfastened and we walked up the stone path through a wilderness of weeds four windows of the house were visible two on the ground floor and two above those on the ground floor were heavily boarded up those above though glazed boasted neither blinds nor curtains craigmire tower showed not the slightest evidence of tenancy we mounted three steps and stood before a tremendously massive oaken door an iron bell-pull ancient and rusty hung on the right of the door and smith giving me an odd glance seized the ring and tugged it from somewhere within the building answered a mournful clangour a cracked and toneless jangle which seeming to echo through empty apartments sought and found an exit apparently by way of one of the openings in the round tower for it was from above our heads that the noise came to us it died away that eerie ringing that clanging so dismal that it could chill my heart even then with the bright sunlight streaming down out of the blue it awoke no other response than the mournful cry of the seagull circling over our heads silence fell we looked at one another and we were both about to express a mutual doubt when unheralded by any unfastening of bolts or bars the oaken door was opened and a huge mulatto dressed in white stood there regarding us i started nervously for the apparition was so unexpected but nayland smith without evidence of surprise thrust a card into the man's hand take my card to mr van roon and say that i wish to see him on important business he directed authoritatively 
the mulatto bowed and retired his white figure seemed to be swallowed up by the darkness within for beyond the patch of uncarpeted floor revealed by the peeping sunlight was a barn-like place of densest shadow i was about to speak but smith laid his hand upon my arm warningly as out from the shadows the mulatto returned he stood on the right of the door and bowed again be pleased to enter he said in his harsh negro voice mr van roon will see you the gladness of the sun could no longer stir me a chill and a sense of foreboding bore me company as beside nayland smith i entered cragmire tower End of chapter twenty one recording by elaine tweddle sterling ontario Chapter twenty two of the Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter twenty two. The Mulatto. The room in which Van Roon received us was roughly of the shape of an old fashioned keyhole. One end of it occupied the base of the tower, upon which the remainder had evidently been built. In many respects it was a singular room, but the feature which caused me the greatest amazement was this. It had no windows. In the deep alcove formed by the tower sat Van Roon at a littered table, upon which stood an oil reading lamp, green-shaded, of the Victoria pattern, to furnish the entire illumination of the apartment. That bookshelves lined the rectangular portion of this strange study I divined, although that end of the place was dark as a catacomb. The walls were wood-panelled, and the ceiling was oak-beamed. A small bookshelf and tumble-down cabinet stood upon either side of the table, and the celebrated American author and traveller lay propped up in a long split-cane chair. He wore smoked glasses, and had a clean-shaven olive face, with a profusion of jet-black hair. He was garbed in a dirty red dressing-gown, and a perfect fog of cigar-smoke hung in the room. He did not rise to greet us, but merely extended his right hand between two fingers whereof he held Smith's card. "'You will excuse the seeming discourtesy of an invalid, gentlemen,' he said, "'but I am suffering from an undue temerity of the interior of China.' He waved his hand vaguely, and I saw that two rough deal chairs stood near the table. Smith and I seated ourselves, and my friend, leaning his elbow upon the table, looked fixedly at the face of the man whom we had come from London to visit. Although comparatively unfamiliar to the British public, the name of Van Roon was well known in American literary circles, for he enjoyed in the United States a reputation somewhat similar to that which had rendered the name of our mutual friend, Sir Lionel Barton, a household word in England. It was Van Roon who, following the footsteps of Madame Blavatsky, had sought out the haunts of the fabled Mahatmas and Himalayas, and Van Roon who had essayed to explore the fever swamps of Yucatan in quest of the secret of lost Atlantis. Lastly, it was Van Roon who, in an overland car specially built for him by a celebrated American firm, had undertaken the journey across China. I studied the olive face with curiosity. Its natural impassivity was so greatly increased by the presence of the coloured spectacles that my study was as profitless as if I had scrutinised the face of a carven Buddha. The mulatto had withdrawn, and in an atmosphere of gloom and tobacco-smoke, Smith and I sat staring, perhaps rather rudely, at the object of our visit to the West Country. "'Mr. Van Roon,' began my friend abruptly, "'you will no doubt have seen this paragraph. It appeared in this morning's Daily Telegraph.' He stood up, and, taking out the cutting from his notebook, placed it on the table. "'I have seen this, yes,' said Van Roon, revealing a row of even white teeth and a rapid smile. "'Is it to this paragraph that I owe the pleasure of seeing you here?' "'The paragraph appeared in this morning's issue,' replied Smith. "'An hour from the time of seeing it, my friend Dr. Petrie and I were in train for Bridgewater.' your visit delights me gentlemen and i should be ungrateful to question its cause but frankly i am at a loss to understand why you should have honoured me thus i am a poor host god knows for what with my tortured limb a legacy from the chinese devils whose secrets i surprised and my semi-blindness due to the same cause i am but sorry company nayland smith held up his right hand deprecatingly van roon tendered a box of cigars and clapped his hands whereupon the mulatto entered 
"'I can see you have a story to tell me, Mr. Smith,' he said. "'Therefore I suggest whisky and soda, or you might prefer tea, as it's nearly tea-time.' Smith and I chose the former refreshment, and the soft-footed half-breed having departed upon his errand, my companion, leaning forward earnestly across the littered table, outlined for Van Roon the story of Dr. Fu Manchu the great and malign being whose mission in england at that moment was none other than the stoppage of just such information as our host was preparing to give to the world there is a giant conspiracy mr van roon he said which had its birth in this very province of honan from which you were so fortunate to escape alive whatever its scope or limitations a great secret society is established among the yellow races it means that china which has slumbered for so many generations now stirs in that age-long sleep i need not tell you how much more it means this seething in the pot in a word interrupted van roon pushing smith's glass across the table you would say that your life is not worth that replied smith snapping his fingers before the other's face a very impressive silence fell. I watched Van Roon curiously as he sat propped up amongst his cushions, his smooth face ghastly in the green light from the lampshade. He held the stump of a cigar between his teeth, but apparently unnoticed by him. It had long since gone out. Smith, out of the shadows, was watching him too, then— "'Your information is very disturbing.' said the american i am more disposed to credit your statement because i am all too painfully aware of the existence of such a group as you mention in china but that they had an agent here in england is something i had never conjectured in seeking out this solitary residence i have unwittingly done much to assist their designs but my dear mr smith i am very remiss of course you will remain to-night and i trust for some days to come Smith glanced rapidly across at me, and then turned again to our host. "'It seems like forcing our company upon you,' he said. "'But in your own interests I think it would be best to do as you are good enough to suggest. I hope and believe that our arrival here has not been noticed by the enemy. Therefore it will be well if we remain concealed as much as possible for the present until we have settled upon some plan.' "'Hagar shall go to the station for your baggage,' said the American rapidly, and clapped his hands, his usual signal to the mulatto." Whilst the latter was receiving his orders, I noticed Nayland Smith watching him closely, and when he had departed— "'How long has that man been in your service?' snapped my friend. Van Roon peered blindly through his smoked glasses. "'For some years,' he replied. "'He was with me in India, and in China.' "'Where did you engage him?' "'Actually, in St. Kitts.' "'Hm,' muttered Smith, and automatically he took out and began to fill his pipe. "'I can offer you no company but my own, gentlemen,' continued Van Roon, "'but unless it interferes with your plans, you may find the surrounding district of interest and worthy of inspection between now and dinner-time. By the way, I think I can promise you a quite satisfactory meal, for Hagar is a model chef.' "'A walk would be enjoyable,' said Smith, but dangerous. "'Ah, perhaps you are right. Evidently you apprehend some attempt upon me?' "'At any moment.' to one in my crippled condition an alarming outlook however i place myself unreservedly in your hands but really you must not leave this interesting district before you have made the acquaintance of some of its historical spots to me stooped as i am in what i may term the lore of the odd it is a veritable wonderland almost as interesting in its way as the caves and jungles of hindustan depicted by madame blavatsky his high-pitched voice and a certain laboured intonation not quite so characteristically american as was his accent rose even higher he spoke with the fire of the enthusiast when i learned that cragmar tower was vacant he continued i leaped at the chance excuse the metaphor from a lame man this is a ghost hunter's paradise the tower itself is of unknown origin though probably phoenician and the house traditionally sheltered dr mccloy the necromancer after his flight from the persecution of james of scotland then, to add to its interest, its borders on Sedgemoor, the scene of the bloody battle during the Monmouth Rising, whereat a thousand were slain in the field. And it is a local legend that the unhappy duke and his staff may be seen on stormy nights crossing the path which skirts the mire after which this building is named, with flaming torches held aloft. "'Merely marsh lights, I take it?' interjected Smith, gripping his pipe hard between his teeth. 
"'Your practical mind naturally seeks a practical explanation,' smiled Van Roon. "'That I myself have other theories. "'Then, in addition to the charms of Sedgemore, haunted Sedgemore, on a fine day it is, "'quite possible to see the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey from here. "'And Glastonbury Abbey, as you may know, is closely bound up with the history of alchemy. "'It was in the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey that the adept Kelly, "'companion of Dr. D., discovered in the reign of Elizabeth "'the famous caskets of St. Dunstan, containing two tinctures.' so he ran on enumerating the odd charms of his residence charms which for my part i did not find appealing finally we cannot presume further upon your kindness said nayland smith standing up no doubt we can amuse ourselves in the neighbourhood of the house until the return of your servant look upon craigmire tower as your own gentleman cried van roon most of the rooms are unfurnished and the garden is a wilderness but the structure of the brickwork in the tower may interest you archaeologically and the view across the moor is at least as fine as any in the neighbourhood so with his brilliant smile and a gesture of one thin yellow hand the crippled traveller made us free of his odd dwelling as i passed out from the room close at smith's heels i glanced back i cannot say why Van Roon was already bending over his papers, in his green-shadowed sanctuary, and the light shining down upon his smoked glasses created the odd illusion that he was looking over the tops of the lenses, and not down at the table, as his attitude suggested. However, it was probably ascribable to the weird chiaroscuro of the scene, although it gave the seated figure an oddly malignant appearance, and I passed out through the utter darkness of the outer room to the front door. Smith, opening it, I was conscious of surprise to find dusk come, to meet darkness where I had looked for sunlight. The silver wisps which had raced along the horizon as we came to Cragmire Tower had been harbingers of other and heavier banks. A stormy sunset smeared crimson streaks across the skyline, where a great range of clouds, like the oily smoke of a city burning, was banked, mountain topping mountain, and lighted from below by this angry red. As we came down the steps and out by the gate, I turned and looked across the moor behind us. A sort of reflection from this distant blaze encrimsoned the whole landscape. The inland bay glowed sullenly, as if internal fires and not reflected light were at work, a scene both wild and majestic. Nayland Smith was staring up at the cone-like top of the ancient tower in a curious, speculative fashion. Under the influence of our host's conversation, I had forgotten the reasonless dread which had touched me at the moment of our arrival, but now, with the red light blazing over Sedgemoor, as if in memory of the blood which had been shed there, and with the tower of unknown origin looming above me, I became very uncomfortable again, nor did I envy Van Roon his eerie residence. The proximity of a tower of any kind at night makes in some inexplicable way for all, and to-night there were other agents, too. "'What's that?' snapped Smith, suddenly grasping my arm. He was peering southward, toward the distant hamlet, and starting violently at his words, and the sudden grasp of his hand, I too stared in that direction. "'We were followed, Petrie,' he almost whispered. "'I never got a sight of our follower, but I swear we were followed. Look, there's something moving over yonder.' Together we stood staring into the dusk, then Smith burst abruptly into one of his rare laughs, and clapped me upon the shoulder. "'It's Hagar the mulatto,' he cried, "'and our grips. That extraordinary American, with his tales of witch-lights and haunted abbeys, has been playing the devil with our nerves.' Together we waited by the gate, until the half-caste appeared on the bend of the path with a grip in either hand. He was a great muscular fellow with a stoic face, and, for the purpose of visiting Saul, presumably, he had doffed his white raiment, and now wore a sort of livery with a peaked cap. Smith watched him enter the house, then— "'I wonder where Van Roon obtains his provisions, and so forth,' he muttered. "'It's odd they knew nothing about the new tenant of Cragmire Tower at the Wagoners.' There came a sort of sudden expectancy into his manner, for which I found myself at a loss to account. He turned his gaze inland, and stood there, tugging at his left ear and clicking his teeth together. He stared at me, and his eyes looked very bright in the dusk, for a sort of red glow from the sunset touched them, and he spoke no word, merely taking my arm and leading me off on a rambling walk around and about the house. Neither of us spoke a word until we stood at the gate of Craigmire Tower again, then— "'I swear now that we were followed here to-day,' muttered Smith. The lofty place immediately within the doorway proved, in the light of a lamp now fixed in an iron bracket, to be a square entrance hall meagerly furnished. The closed study door faced the entrance, and on the left of it ascended an open staircase up which the mulatto led the way. 
we found ourselves on the floor above in a corridor traversing the house from back to front an apartment on the immediate left was indicated by the mulatto as that allotted to smith it was a room of fair size furnished quite simply but boasting a wardrobe cupboard and then smith's grip stood beside the white enamelled bed i glanced around and then prepared to follow the man who had awaited me in the doorway he still wore his dark livery and as i followed the lithe broad-shouldered figure along the corridor i found myself considering critically his breadth of shoulder and the extraordinary thickness of his neck i have repeatedly spoken of a sort of foreboding an elusive stirring in the depths of my being of which i became conscious at certain times in my dealings with dr fu manchu and his murderous servants this sensation or something akin to it claimed me now unaccountably as i stood looking into the neat bedroom on the same side of the corridor but at the extreme end wherein i was to sleep a voiceless warning urged me to return a kind of childish panic came fluttering about my heart a dread of entering the room of allowing the mulatto to come behind me doubtless this was no more than a subconscious product of my observations respecting his abnormal breadth of shoulder but whatever the origin of the impulse i found myself unable to disobey it therefore i merely nodded turned on my heel and went back to smith's room i closed the door then turned to face smith who stood regarding me smith i said that man sends cold water trickling down my spine still regarding me fixedly my friend nodded his head you are curiously sensitive to this sort of thing he replied slowly i have noticed it before as a useful capacity i don't like the look of the man myself the fact that he's been in van roon's employ for some years goes for nothing we are neither of us likely to forget Kui, the chinese servant of sir lionel barton and it's quite possible that fu manchu has corrupted this man as he corrupted the other it is quite possible his voice trailed off into silence and we stood looking across the room with unseeing eyes meditating deeply it was quite dark now outside as i could see through the uncurtained window which opened upon the dreary expanse stretching out to haunted sedgemoor two candles were burning upon the dressing-table they were but recently lighted and so intense was the stillness that i could distinctly hear the spluttering of one of the wicks which was damp Without giving the slightest warning of his intention, Smith suddenly made two strides forward, stretched out his long arms, and snuffed the pair of candles in a twinkling. The room became plunged in impenetrable darkness. "'Not a word, Petrie,' whispered my companion. I moved cautiously to join him, but as I did so, perceived that he was moving too. Vaguely against the window I perceived him silhouetted. He was looking out across the moor, and— "'See! See!' he hissed. With my heart thumping furiously in my breast, I bent over him, and for the second time since our coming to Craigmire Tower, my thoughts flew to the Fenmen. There are shades in the Fen, ghosts of women and men, who have sinned and died, but are living again. Over the waters they tread, with their lanterns of dread, and they peer in the pools, in the pools of the dead. A light was dancing out upon the moor a witch-light that came and went unaccountably up and down, in and out, now clearly visible, now masked in the darkness. "'Lock the door,' snapped my companion, "'if there's a key.' I crept across the room and fumbled for a moment, then— "'There is no key,' I reported. "'Then wedge the chair under the knob and let no one enter until I return,' he said amazingly with that he opened the window to its fullest extent threw his leg over the sill and went creeping along a wide concrete ledge in which ran a leaded gutter in the direction of the tower on the right not pausing to follow his instructions respecting the chair i craned out of the window watching his progress and wondering with what sudden madness he was bitten indeed i could not credit my senses could not believe that i heard and saw aright yet there out in the darkness on the moor moved the will-o'-the-wisp and ten yards along the gutter crept my friend like a great gaunt cat unknown to me he must have prospected the route by daylight for now i saw his design the ledge terminated only where it met the ancient wall of the tower and it was possible for an agile climber to step from it to the ledge of the unglazed window some four feet below and to scramble from that point to the stone fence and thence on to the path by which we had come from Seoul. this difficult operation nayland smith successfully performed and to my unbounded amazement went racing into the darkness toward the dancing lights headlong like a madman 
the night swallowed him up and between my wonder and my fear my hands trembled so violently that i could scarce support myself where i rested with my full weight upon the sill i seemed now to be moving through the fevered phases of a nightmare around and below me cragmire tower was profoundly silent but a faint odour of cookery was now perceptible outside from the night came a faint whispering as of the distant sea but no moon and no stars relieved the impenetrable blackness only out over the moor the mysterious light still danced and moved one two three four five minutes passed the light vanished and did not appear again five more age-long minutes elapsed in absolute silence whilst i peered into the darkness of the night and listened every nerve in my body tense for the return of nayland smith yet two more minutes which embraced an agony of suspense passed in the same fashion then a shadowy form grew phantomesque out of the gloom a moment more and i distinctly heard the heavy breathing of a man nearly spent and saw my friend scrambling up toward the black embrasure in the tower his voice came huskily pantingly creep along and lend me a hand petrie i am nearly winded i crept through the window steadied my quivering nerves by an effort of the will and reached the end of the ledge in time to take smith's extended hand and to draw him up beside me against the wall of the tower he was shaking with his exertions and must have fallen i think without my assistance inside the room again quick light the candles he breathed hoarsely did any one come no one nothing having expended several matches in vain for my fingers twitched nervously i ultimately succeeded in relighting the candles get along to your room directed smith your apprehensions are unfounded at the moment but you may as well leave both doors wide open i looked into his face it was very drawn and grim and his brow was wet with perspiration but his eyes had the fighting glint and i knew that we were upon the eve of strange happenings End of chapter 22 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario Chapter 23 Of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter twenty three A Cry on the Moor. Of the events intervening between this moment and that when death called to us out of the night, I have the haziest recollections. An excellent dinner was served in the bleak and gloomy dining room by the mulatto, and the crippled author was carried to the head of the table by this same Herculean attendant, as lightly as though he had but the weight of a child van roon talked continuously revealing a deep knowledge of all sorts of obscure matters and in the brief intervals nayland smith talked also with almost feverish rapidity plans for the future were discussed i can recall no one of them i could not stifle my queer sentiments in regard to the mulatto and every time i found him behind my chair i was hard put to repress a shudder in this fashion the strange evening passed and to the accompaniment of distant muttering thunder we two guests retired to our chambers in cragmire tower smith had contrived to give me my instructions in a whisper and five minutes after entering my own room i had snuffed the candles slipped a wedge which he had given me under the door crept out through the window on to the gutted ledge and joined smith in his room he too had extinguished his candles and the place was in darkness as i climbed in he grasped my wrist to silence me and turned me forcibly toward the window listen he said i turned and looked out upon a prospect which had been a fit setting for the witch scene in macbeth thunder clouds hung low over the moor but through them ran a sort of chasm or rift allowing a bar of lurid light to stretch across the drear from east to west a sort of lane walled by darkness there came a remote murmuring as of a troubled sea a hushed and distant chorus and sometimes in upon it broke the drums of heaven in the west lightning flickered though but faintly intermittently then came the call 
out of the blackness of the moor it came wild and distant help help smith i whispered what is it what mr smith came the agonized cry nayland smith help for god's sake quick smith i cried quick man it's van roon he's been dragged out they are murdering him nayland smith held me in a vice-like grip silent unmoved louder and more agonized came the cry for aid and i became more than ever certain that it was poor van roon who uttered it mr smith dr petrie for god's sake come or it will be too late smith i said turning furiously upon my friend if you are going to remain here whilst murder is done i am not my blood boiled now with hot resentment it was incredible inhuman that we should remain there inert whilst a fellow man and our host to boot was being done to death out there in the darkness i exerted all my strength to break away but although my efforts told upon him as his loud breathing revealed nayland smith clung to me tenaciously had my hands been free in my fury i could have struck him for the pitiable cries growing fainter now told their own tale then smith spoke shortly and angrily breathing hard between the words be quiet you fool he snapped it's little less than an insult petrie to think me capable of refusing help where help is needed like a cold douche his words acted in that instant i knew myself a fool you remember the call of siva he said thrusting me away irritably two years ago and what it meant to those who obeyed it you might have told me told you you would have been through the window before i'd uttered two words i realized the truth of his assertion and the justness of his anger forgive me old man i said very crestfallen and my impulse was a natural one you'll admit you must remember that i've been trained never to refuse aid when aid is asked shut up petrie he growled forget it the cries had ceased now entirely and a peal of thunder louder than any yet echoed over distant sedgemoor a chasm of light splitting the heavens closed in leaving the night wholly black don't talk rapped smith act you wedged your door yes good get into that cupboard have your browning ready and keep the door very slightly ajar he was in that mood of repressed fever which i knew and which always communicated itself to me i spoke no further word but stepped into the wardrobe indicated and drew the door nearly shut the recess just accommodated me and through the aperture i could see the bed vaguely the open window and part of the opposite wall i saw smith cross the floor as a mighty clap of thunder boomed over the house a gleam of lightning flickered through the gloom i saw the bed for a moment distinctly and it appeared to me that smith lay therein with the sheets pulled up over his head the light was gone and i could hear big drops of rain pattering upon the leaden gutter below the open window my mood was strange detached and characterized by vagueness that van roon lay dead upon the moor i was convinced and although i recognized that it must be a sufficient one i could not even dimly divine the reason why we had refrained from lending him aid to have failed to save him knowing his peril would have been bad enough to have refused i thought was shameful better to have shared his fate yet the downpour was increasing and beating now a regular tattoo upon the gutterway then splitting the oblong of greater blackness which marked the casement quivered dazzlingly another flash of lightning in which i saw the bed again with that impression of smith curled up in it the blinding light died out came the crash of thunder harsh and fearsome more imminently above the tower than ever the building seemed to shake coming as they did horror and the wrath of heaven together suddenly crashingly black and angry after the fairness of the day these happenings and their settings must have terrorized the stoutest heart but somehow i seemed detached as i have said and set apart from the whirl of events a spectator even when a vague yellow light crept across the room from the direction of the door and flickered unsteadily on the bed i remained unmoved to a certain degree although passively alive to the significance of the incident. I realized that the ultimate issue was at hand, but either because I was emotionally exhausted or from some other cause, the pending climax failed to disturb me. 
going on tiptoe in stockinged feet across my field of vision past keegan van roon he was in his shirt sleeves and held a lighted candle in one hand whilst with the other he shaded it against the draught from the window he was a cripple no longer and the smoked glasses were discarded most of the light at the moment when i first saw him shone upon his thin olive face and at sight of his eyes much of the mystery of cragmire tower was resolved for they were oblique very slightly but nevertheless unmistakably oblique though highly educated and possibly an american citizen van roon was a chinaman upon the picture of his face as i saw it then i do not care to dwell it lacked the unique horror of dr fu manchu's unforgettable countenance but possessed a sort of animal malignancy which the latter lacked he approached within three or four feet of the bed peering peering then with a timidity which spoke well for nayland smith's reputation paused and beckoned to some one who evidently stood in the doorway behind him as he did so i noted that the legs of his trousers were caked with greenish-brown mud nearly up to the knees the huge mulatto silent-footed crossed to the bed in three strides he was stripped to the waist and excepting some few professional athletes i had never seen a torso to compare with that which brown and glistening now bent over nayland smith the muscular development was simply enormous the man had a neck like a column and the thews around his back and shoulders were like ivy tentacles wreathing some gnarled oak whilst van roon his evil gaze upon the bed held the candle aloft the mulatto with a curious preparatory writhing movement of the mighty shoulders lowered his outstretched fingers to the disordered bed linen i pushed open the cupboard door and thrust out the browning as i did so a dramatic thing happened a tall gaunt figure shot suddenly upright from the bed it was nayland smith upraised in his hand he held a heavy walking cane i knew the handle to be leaded and i could judge of the force with which he wielded it by the fact that it cut the air with a keen swishing sound it descended upon the back of the mulatto's skull with a sickening thud and the great brown body dropped inert upon the padded bed in which not smith but his grip reposed there was no word no cry then shoot petrie shoot the fiend shoot van roon dropping the candle in the falling gleam of which i saw the whites of the oblique eyes turned and leaped from the room with the agility of a wild cat the ensuing darkness was split by a streak of lightning and there was nayland smith scrambling around the foot of the bed and making for the door in hot pursuit we gained it almost together smith had dropped the cane and now held his pistol in his hand together we fired into the chasm of the corridor and in a flash saw van roon hurling himself down the stairs he went silently in his stockinged feet and our own clatter was drowned by the awful booming of the thunder which now burst over us again crack 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 three times our pistols spat venomously after the flying figure then we had crossed the hall below and were in the wilderness of the night with the rain descending upon us in sheets vaguely i saw the white shirt-sleeves of the fugitive near the corner of the stone fence a moment he hesitated then darted away inland not towards saul but toward the moor and the cup of the inland bay steady petrie steady cried nayland smith he ran panting beside me it is the path to the mire he breathed sibilantly between every few words it was out there that he hoped to lure us with a cry for help a great blaze of lightning illuminated the landscape as far as the eye could see ahead of us a flying shape hair lank and glistening in the downpour followed a faint path skirting that green tongue of morass which we had noted from the upland it was keegan van roon he glanced over his shoulder showing a yellow terror-stricken face we were gaining upon him darkness fell and the thunder cracked and boomed as though the very moor were splitting about us another fifty yards petrie breathed nayland smith and after that it's uncharted ground on we went through the rain and the darkness then slow up slow up cried smith it feels soft indeed already i had made one false step and the hungry mire had fastened upon my foot almost tripping me lost the path we stopped dead 
the falling rain walled us in i dared not move for i knew that the mire the devouring mire stretched eager close about my feet we were both waiting for the next flash of lightning i think but before it came out of the darkness ahead of us rose a cry that sometimes rings in my ears to this hour yet it was no more than a repetition of that which had called to us deathfully a while before help help for god's sake help quick i am sinking nayland smith grasped my arm furiously we dare not move petrie we dare not move he breathed it's god's justice visible for once then came the lightning and ignoring a splitting crash behind us we both looked ahead over the mire just on the edge of the venomous green path not thirty yards away i saw the head and shoulders and upstretched appealing arms of van roon evening as the lightning flickered and we saw him he was gone with one last long drawn-out cry horribly like the mournful wail of a seagull he was gone that eerie light died and in the instant before the sound of the thunder came shatteringly we turned about in time to see cragmire tower a blacker silhouette against the night topple and fall a red glow began to be perceptible above the building the thunder came booming through the caverns of space nayland smith lowered his wet face close to mine and shouted in my ear keegan van roon never returned from china it was a trap those were two creatures of dr fu manchu the thunder died away hollowly echoing over the distant sea that light on the moor to-night you have not learned morse code petrie it was a signal and it read s m i t h s o s well i took the chance as you know and it was karamina she knew of the plot to bury us in the mire she had followed us from london but could do nothing until dusk god forgive me if i have misjudged her for we owe her our lives to-night flames were bursting up from the building beside the ruin of the ancient tower which had faced the storms of countless ages only to succumb at last the lightning literally had cloven it in twain the mulatto again the lightning flashed and we saw the path and began to retrace our steps Nayland Smith turned to me, and his face was very grim in that unearthly light, and his eyes shone like steel. I killed him, Petrie, as I meant to do. From out over Sedgemoor it came, cracking and rolling and booming towards us, swelling in volume to a stupendous climax, that awful laughter of Jove, the destroyer of Cragmire Tower. End of chapter 23 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario. Chapter Twenty Four of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty Four. Story of the Gables. In looking over my notes dealing with the second phase of Dr. Fu Manchu's activities in England, I find that one of the worst hours of my life was associated with the singular and seemingly inconsequent adventure of the fiery hand. I shall deal with it in this place, begging you to bear with me if I seem to digress. Inspector Weymouth called one morning, shortly after the Van Roon episode, and entered upon a surprising account of a visit to a house at Hampstead, which enjoyed the sinister reputation of being uninhabitable but in what way does the case enter into your province inquired nayland smith idly tapping out his pipe on a bar of the grate we had not long finished breakfast but from an early hour smith had been at his eternal smoking which only the advent of the meal had interrupted well replied the inspector who occupied a big armchair near the window i was sent to look into it i suppose because i had nothing better to do at the moment ah jerked smith glancing over his shoulder the ejaculation had a veiled significance, for our quest of Dr. Fu Manchu had come to an abrupt termination by reason of the fact that all trace of that malignant genius and of the group surrounding him had vanished with the destruction of Craigmire Tower. "'The house is called the Gables,' continued the Scotland Yard man, "'and I knew I was on a wild-goose chase from the first. "'Why?' snapped Smith. 
"'Because I was there before, six months ago or so, just before your present return to England, and I knew what to expect.' Smith looked up with some faint dawning of interest perceptible in his manner. "'I was unaware,' he said with a slight smile, "'that the cleaning up of haunted houses came within the jurisdiction of Scotland Yard. I am learning something.' "'In the ordinary way,' replied the big man good-humouredly, "'it doesn't, but a sudden death always excites suspicion, and—' "'A sudden death?' I said, glancing up. "'You didn't explain that the ghost had killed anyone.' "'I'm afraid I'm a poor hand at yarn-spinning, doctor,' said Weymouth, turning his blue, twinkling eyes in my direction. Two people have died at the Gables within the last six months.' "'You begin to interest me,' declared Smith, and there came something of the old, eager look into his gaunt face, as having lighted his pipe he tossed the match-end into the hearth. "'I had hoped for some little excitement myself,' confessed the inspector. "'This dead end, with not a ghost of a clue to the whereabouts of the yellow fiend, has been getting on my nerves.' Nayland Smith grunted sympathetically. "'Although Dr. Fu Manchu has been in England for some months now,' continued Weymouth, "'I have never set eyes upon him.' The house we raided in Museum Street proved to be empty. In a word, I am wasting my time. So that I volunteered to run up to Hampstead to look into the matter of the Gables, principally as a distraction. It's a queer business, but more in the Psychical Research Society's line than mine, I'm afraid. Still, if there were no Dr. Fu Manchu, it might be of interest to you, and to you, Dr. Petrie, because it illustrates the fact that, given the right sort of subject, death can be brought about without any elaborate mechanism, such as our Chinese friends employ. "'You interest me more and more,' declared Smith, stretching himself in the long white cane rest-chair. Two men, both fairly sound, except that the first one had an asthmatic heart, have died at the gables without anyone laying a finger upon them. Oh, there was no jugglery. They weren't poisoned, or bitten by venomous insects, or suffocated, or anything like that. They just died of fear. Stark fear.' With my elbows resting upon the table cover and my chin in my hands, I was listening attentively now, and Nayland Smith, a big cushion behind his head, was watching the speaker with a keen and speculative look in those steely eyes of his. "'You imply that Dr. Fu Manchu has something to learn from the Gables?' he jerked. Weymouth nodded stolidly. "'I can't work up anything like amazement in these days,' continued the latter. "'Every other case seems stale and hackneyed alongside the case.' But I must confess that when the gables came on the books of the yard the second time, I began to wonder. I thought there might be some tangible clue, some link connecting the two victims, perhaps some evidence of robbery or of revenge or some sort of motive. In short, I hoped to find evidence of human agency at work, but, as before, I was disappointed. "'It's a legitimate case of a haunted house, then,' said Smith. "'Yes, we find them occasionally, these uninhabitable places, where there is something, something malignant and harmful to human life, but something that you cannot arrest, that you cannot hope to bring into court.' "'Ah,' replied Smith slowly, "'I suppose you are right. There are historic instances, of course, Glamis Castle and Spedlin's Tower in Scotland, Peel Castle, Isle of Man, with its Maud Du, the Great Lady of Raynham Hall, the Headless Horses of Caister, the Wesley ghost of Epworth Rectory, and others. But I have never come in personal contact with such a case, and if I did I should feel very humiliated to have to confess that there was an agency which could produce a physical result, death, but which was immune from physical retaliation. Weymouth nodded his head again. I might feel a bit sour about it, too, he replied, if it were not that I haven't much pride left in these days, considering the show of physical retaliation I have made against Dr. Fu Manchu. "'A home thrust, Weymouth,' snapped Nayland Smith, with one of those rare boyish laughs of his. "'We're children to that Chinese doctor, Inspector, to that weird product of a weird people who are as old and evil as the pyramids are old in mystery. "'But what about the Gables? "'Well, it's an uncanny place. "'You have mentioned Glamis Castle a moment ago, and it's possible to understand an old stronghold like that being haunted.' But the Gables was only built about 1870. It's quite a modern house. It was built for a wealthy Quaker family, and they occupied it uninterruptedly and apparently without anything unusual occurring for over forty years. Then it was sold for Mr. Madison, and Mr. Madison died there six months ago. Madison? said Smith sharply, staring across at Weymouth. What was he? Where did he come from? He was a retired tea planter from Colombo, replied the inspector. Colombo? 
there was a link with the east certainly if that's what you are thinking and it was this fact which interested me at the time and which led me to waste precious days and nights on the case that there was no mortal connection between this liverish individual and the schemes of dr fu manchu i'm certain of that and how did he die i asked interestedly he just died in his chair one evening in the room which he used as a library it was his custom to sit there every night when there were no visitors reading until twelve o'clock or later he was a bachelor and his household consisted of a cook a housemaid and a man who had been with him for thirty years i believe at the time of mr madison's death his household had recently been deprived of two of its members the cook and housemaid both resigned one morning giving as their reason the fact that the place was haunted in what way i interviewed the precious pair at the time and they told me absurd and various tales about dark figures wandering around the corridors and bending over them in bed at night whispering when their chief trouble was a continuous ringing of bells about the house bells they said that it became unbearable night and day there were bells ringing all over the house at any rate they went and for three or four days the gables was occupied only by mr madison and his man whose name was stevens i interviewed the latter also and he was an altogether more reliable witness a decent steady sort of man whose story impressed me very much at the time did he confirm the ringing he swore to it a sort of jangle sometimes up in the air near the ceilings and sometimes under the floor like the shaking of silver bells nayland smith stood up abruptly and began to pace the room leaving great trails of blue-gray smoke behind him your story is sufficiently interesting inspector he declared even to divert my mind from the eternal contemplation of the fu manchu problem this would appear to be distinctly a case of an astral bell such as we sometimes hear of in india it was stevens continued weymouth who found mr madison he stevens had been out on business connected with the household arrangements and at about eleven o'clock he returned letting himself in with a key and there was a light in the library and getting no response to his knocking stevens entered he found his master sitting bolt upright in a chair clutching the arms with rigid fingers and staring straight before him with a look of such frightful horror on his face that stevens positively ran from the room and out of the house mr madison was stone dead when a doctor who lives at no great distance away came and examined him he could find no trace of violence whatever he had apparently died of fright to judge from the expression on his face anything else only this i learnt indirectly that the last member of the quaker family to occupy the house had apparently witnessed the apparition which had led to his vacating the place i got the story from the wife of a man who had been employed as a gardener there at the time the apparition which he witnessed in the hallway if i remember rightly took the form of a sort of luminous hand clutching a long curved knife oh heavens cried smith and laughed shortly that's quite in order this gentleman told no one of the occurrence until after he had left the house no doubt in order that the place should not acquire an evil reputation most of the original furniture remained and mr madison took the house furnished i don't think there can be any doubt that what killed him was fear at seeing a repetition of the fiery hand concluded smith quite so well i examined the gables pretty closely and with another scotland yard mad spent a night in the empty house we saw nothing but once very faintly we heard the ringing of bells smith spun around upon him rapidly you can swear to that he snapped i can swear to it declared weymouth stolidly it seemed to be over our heads we were sitting in the dining-room then it was gone and we heard nothing more whatever of an unusual nature following the death of mr madison the gables remained empty until a while ago when a french gentleman named leger leased it furnished yes nothing was removed who kept the place in order a married couple living in the neighbourhood undertook to do so the man attended to the lawn and so forth and the woman came once a week i believe to clean up the house and leger he came in only last week having leased the house for six months his family were to have joined him in a day or two and he with the aid of the pair i have just mentioned and assisted by a french servant he brought over with him was putting the place in order at about twelve o'clock on friday night this servant ran into a neighbouring house screaming the fiery hand and when at last a constable arrived and a frightened group went up to the avenue to the gables they found monsieur leger dead in the avenue near the steps just outside the hall door he had the same face of horror what a tale for the press snapped smith the owner has managed to keep it quiet so far but this time i think it will leak into the press yes there was a short silence then 
have you been down to the gables again i was there on saturday but there's not a scrap of evidence the man undoubtedly died of fright in the same way as madison the place ought to be pulled down it's unholy unholy is the word i said i never heard anything like it this monsieur leger had no enemies there could be no possible motive none whatever he was a business man from marseilles and his affairs necessitated his remaining in or near london for some considerable time therefore he decided to make his headquarters here temporarily and lease the gables without intention nayland smith was pacing the floor with increasing rapidity he was tugging at the lobe of his left ear and his pipe had long since gone out end of chapter twenty four recording by elaine tweddle sterling Ontario. Chapter Twenty Five of the Return of Doctor Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Doctor Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty Five. The Bells. I started to my feet as a tall, bearded man swung open the door and hurled himself impetuously into the room. He wore a silk hat, which fitted him very ill, and a black frock coat, which did not fit him at all. "'It's all right, Petrie,' cried the apparition. "'I've leased the gables.' It was Nathan Smith. I stared at him in amazement. "'The first time I have employed a disguise,' continued my friend rapidly, "'since the memorable episode of the false pigtail.' He threw a small brown leather grip upon the floor. "'In case you should care to visit the house, Petrie, I have brought these things. My tenancy commences to-night.' Two days had elapsed, and I had entirely forgotten the strange story of the gables which Inspector Weymouth had related to us. Evidently it was otherwise with my friend, and utterly at a loss for an explanation of his singular behaviour, I stooped mechanically and opened the grip. It contained an odd assortment of garments, and among other things, several grey wigs and a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. Kneeling there with this strange litter about me, I looked up amazedly. Nayland Smith, with the unsuitable silk hat set right upon the back of his head, was pacing the room excitedly, his fuming pipe protruding from the tangle of factitious beard. "'You see, Petrie,' he began again, rapidly, "'I did not entirely trust the agent. I have leased the house in the name of Professor Maxton.' "'But, Smith,' I cried, "'what possible reason can there be for disguise?' "'There's every reason,' he snapped. "'Why should you interest yourself in the gables? "'Does no explanation occur to you?' "'None whatever. "'To me the whole thing's max of stark lunacy. "'Then you won't come?' "'I've never stuck at anything, Smith,' I replied, "'however undignified, "'when it has seemed that my presence "'could be of the slightest use.' As I rose to my feet, Smith stepped in front of me, and the steely grey eyes shone out strangely from the altered face. He clapped his hands upon my shoulders. "'If I assure you that your presence is necessary to my safety,' he said, "'that if you fail me I must seek another companion, will you come?' Instinctively I knew that he was keeping something back, and I was conscious of some resentment, but nevertheless my reply was a foregone conclusion and, with the borrowed appearance of an extremely untidy old man, I crept guiltily out of my house that evening and into the cab which Smith had waiting. The Gables was a roomy and rambling place, lying back a considerable distance from the road. A semicircular drive gave access to the door, and so densely wooded was the ground that, for the most part, the drive was practically a tunnel, a verdant tunnel. A high brick wall concealed the building from the point of view of any one on the roadway, but either horn of the crescent drive terminated at a heavy wrought-iron gateway. Smith discharged the cab at the corner of the narrow and winding road upon which the gables fronted. It was walled in on both sides, on the left the wall being broken by tradesmen's entrances to the houses fronting upon another street, and on the right following uninterruptedly the grounds of the gables. As we came to the gate, nothing now, said Smith, pointing into the darkness of the road before us, except a couple of studios until one comes to the heath. He inserted the key in the lock of the gate and swung it creakingly open. I looked back into the black arch of the avenue, thought of the haunted residence that lay hidden somewhere beyond, of those who had died in it, especially of the one who had died there under the trees, and found myself out of love with the business of the night. 
come on said nayland smith briskly holding the gate open there should be a fire in the library and refreshments if the charwoman has followed instructions i heard the great gate clang to behind us even had there been any moon and there was none i doubted if more than a patch or two of light could have penetrated there the darkness was extraordinary nothing broke it and i think smith must have found his way by the aid of some sixth sense at any rate i saw nothing of the house until i stood some five paces from the steps leading up to the porch a light was burning in the hallway but dimly and inhospitably of the façade of the building i could perceive little when we entered the hall and the door was closed behind us i began wondering anew what purpose my friend hoped to serve by a vigil in this haunted place there was a light in the library, the door of which was ajar, and on a large table were decanters, a siphon, and some biscuits and sandwiches. A large grip stood upon the floor also. For some reason, which was a mystery to me, Smith had decided that we must assume false names whilst under the roof of the gables, and— "'Now, Pierce,' he said, "'a whisky and soda before we look around?' the proposal was welcome enough for i felt strangely dispirited and to tell the truth in my strange disguise not a little ridiculous all my nerves no doubt were highly strung but my sense of hearing unusually acute for i went in momentary expectation of some uncanny happening i had not long to wait as i raised the glass to my lips and glanced across the table at my friend i heard the first faint sound heralding the coming of the bells it did not seem to proceed from anywhere within the library, but from some distant room far away overhead. A musical sound it was, but breaking in upon the silence of that ill-omened house, its music was the music of terror. In a faint and very sweet cascade it rippled, a ringing as of tiny silver bells. I set down my glass upon the table, and, rising slowly from the chair in which I had been seated, stared fixedly at my companion, who was staring with equal fixity at me. I could see that I had not been deluded. Nayland Smith had heard the ringing, too. "'The ghosts waste no time,' he said softly. "'This is not new to me. I spent an hour here last night, and heard the same sound.' I glanced hastily around the room. It was furnished as a library, and contained a considerable collection of works, principally novels. I was unable to judge of the outlook, for the two lofty windows were draped with heavy purple curtains that were drawn close. A silk-shaded lamp swung from the centre of the ceiling, and immediately over the table by which I stood. There was much shadow about the room, and now I glanced apprehensively about me, but especially toward the open door. In that breathless suspense of listening, we stood a while, then, "'There it is again,' whispered Smith, tensely. The ringing of bells was repeated, and seemingly much nearer to us. In fact, it appeared to come from somewhere above, up near the ceiling of the room in which we stood. Simultaneously, we looked up. Then Smith laughed shortly. "'Instinctive, I suppose,' he snapped. "'But what do we expect to see in the air?' The musical sound now grew in volume. The first tiny peal seemed to be reinforced by others, and by others again, until the air around us was filled with the peelings of those invisible bell-ringers. Although, as I have said, the sound was rather musical than horrible, it was, on the other hand, so utterly unaccountable as to touch the supreme heights of the uncanny. I could not doubt that our presence had attracted these unseen ringers to the room in which we stood, and I knew quite well that I was growing pale. This was the room in which at least one unhappy occupant of the gables had died of fear. I recognized the fact that if this mere overture were going to affect my nerves to such an extent, I could not hope to survive the ordeal of the night. A great effort was called for. I emptied my glass at a gulp, and stared across the table at Nayland Smith with a sort of defiance. He was standing very upright and motionless, but his eyes were turning right and left, searching every visible corner of the big room. "'Good,' he said, in a very loud voice. "'The terrorizing power of the unknown is boundless, but we must not get in the grip of panic, or we could not hope to remain in this house ten minutes.' I nodded without speaking. 
then smith to my amazement suddenly began to speak in a loud voice a marked contrast to that almost a whisper in which he'd spoken formerly my dear pierce he cried do you hear the ringing of bells clearly the latter words were spoken for the benefit of the unseen intelligence controlling these manifestations and although i regarded such finesse as somewhat wasted i followed my friend's lead and replied in a voice as loud as his own distinctly professor silence followed my words a silence in which both stood watchful and listening then very faintly i seemed to detect the silvern ringing receding away through distant rooms finally it became inaudible and in the stillness of the gables i could distinctly hear my companion breathing for fully ten minutes we two remained thus each momentarily expecting a repetition of the ringing or the coming of some new and more sinister manifestation but we heard nothing and saw nothing hand me that grip and don't stir till i come back hissed smith in my ear he turned and walked out of the library his boots creaking very loudly in that awe-inspiring silence standing beside the table i watched the open door for his return crushing down a dread that another form than his might suddenly appear there i could hear him moving from room to room and presently as i waited in hushed tense watchfulness he came in depositing the grip upon the table his eyes were gleaming feverishly the house is haunted pierce he cried but no ghost ever frightened me come i will show you your room End of chapter 25 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario Chapter 26 of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer Chapter Twenty Six: The Fiery Hand. Smith walked ahead of me upstairs. He had snapped up the light in the hallway, and now he turned and cried back loudly, "I fear we shall never get servants to stay here." Again, I detected the appeal to a hidden audience, and there was something very uncanny in the idea. The house was now deathly still. The ringing had entirely subsided. In the upper corridor my companion, who seemed to be well acquainted with the position of the switches, again turned up all the lights, and in pursuit of the strange comedy which he saw fit to enact, addressed me continuously in the loud and unnatural voice which he had adopted as part of his disguise. We looked into a number of rooms, all well and comfortably furnished, but although my imagination may have been responsible for the idea, they all seemed to possess a chilly and repellent atmosphere. I felt that to essay sleep in any one of them would be the merest farce, that the place to all intents and purposes was uninhabitable, that something incalculably evil presided over the house. And through it all, so obtuse was I, that no glimmer of the truth entered my mind. Outside again, in the long, brightly lighted corridor, we stood for a moment as if a mutual anticipation of some new event pending had come to us, it was curious, that sudden pulling up and silent questioning of one another, because, although we acted thus, no sound had reached us. A few seconds later our anticipation was realized. From the direction of the stairs it came, a low wailing in a woman's voice, and the sweetness of the tones added to the terror of the sound. I clutched at Smith's arm convulsively, whilst that uncanny cry rose and fell, rose and fell and died away neither of us moved immediately my mind was working with feverish rapidity and seeking to run down a memory which the sound had stirred into faint quickness my heart was still leaping wildly when the wailing began again rising and falling in regular cadence at that instant i identified it during the time smith and i had spent together in egypt two years before searching for karamina 
i had found myself on one occasion in the neighbourhood of a native cemetery near to bedra shaheen and now the scene which i had witnessed there rose up again vividly before me and i seemed to see a little group of black-robed women clustered together about a native grave for the wailing which was now dying away again in the gables was the same or almost the same as the wailing of those egyptian mourners the house was very silent again now my forehead was damp with perspiration and i became more and more convinced that the uncanny ordeal must prove too much for my nerves hitherto i had accorded little credence to tales of the supernatural but face to face with such manifestations as these i realized that i would have faced rather a group of armed dacoits nay dr fu manchu himself than have remained another hour in that ill-omened house my companion must have read as much in my face but he kept up the strange and to me purposeless comedy when he presently spoke i feel it to be incumbent upon me to suggest he said that we spend the night in a hotel after all he walked rapidly downstairs and into the library and began to strap up the grip after all he said there may be a natural explanation of what we've heard for it is noteworthy that we have seen actually nothing it might even be possible to get used to the ringing and the wailing after a time frankly i am loath to go back on my bargain whilst i stared at him in amazement he stood there indeterminate as it seemed then come pierce he cried loudly i can see that you do not share my views but for my part i shall return to-morrow and devote further attention to the phenomena extinguishing the light he walked out into the hallway carrying the grip in his hand i was not far behind him we walked toward the door together and turn the light out pierce directed smith the switch is at your elbow we can see our way to the door well enough now in order to carry out these instructions it became necessary for me to remain a few paces in the rear of my companion and i think i have never experienced such a pang of nameless terror as pierced me at the moment of extinguishing the light for smith had not yet opened the door and the utter darkness of the gables was horrible beyond expression surely darkness is the most potent weapon of the unknown i know that at the moment my hand left the switch i made for the door as though the hosts of hell pursued me i collided violently with smith he was evidently facing toward me in the darkness for at the moment of our collision he grasped my shoulder as in a vice my god petrie look behind you he whispered i was unable to judge to the extent and reality of his fear by the fact that the strange subterfuge of addressing me always as pierce was forgotten i turned in a flash never can i forget what i saw many strange and terrible memories are mine memories stranger and more terrible than those of the average man but this thing which now moves slowly down upon us through the impenetrable gloom of that haunted place was if the term be understood almost absurdly horrible it was a medieval legend come to life in modern london it was as though some horrible chimera of the black and ignorant past was become create and potent in the present a luminous hand a hand in the veins of which fire seemed to run so that the texture of the skin and the shape of the bones within were perceptible in short a hand of glowing fiery flesh clutching a short knife or dagger which also glowed with the same hellish internal luminance was advancing upon us where we stood not three paces removed what i did or how i came to do it i can never recall in all my years i have experienced nothing to equal the stark panic which seized upon me then i know that i uttered a loud and frenzied cry i know that i tore myself like a madman from smith's restraining grip don't touch it keep away for your life i heard but dimly i recollect that finding the thing approaching yet nearer i lashed out with my fists madly blindly and struck something palpable what was the result i cannot say at that moment my recollections merge into confusion something or someone smith as i afterward discovered was hauling me by main force through the darkness 
I fell a considerable distance onto gravel which lacerated my hands and gashed my knees. Then, with the cool night air fanning my brow, I was running, running, my breath coming in hysterical sobs. Beside me fled another figure, and my definite recollections commence again at that point, for this companion of my flight from the gables threw himself roughly against me to alter my course. "'Not that way! Not that way!' came pantingly. "'Not on to the heath! We must keep to the road!' It was Nayland Smith. That healing realization came to me, bringing such a gladness as no words of mine can express nor convey. Still we ran on. "'There's a policeman's lantern,' panted my companion. "'They'll attempt nothing, now.' I gulped down a stiff brandy and soda, then glanced across to where Nayland Smith lay extended on the long cane chair. "'Perhaps you will explain,' I said, "'for what purpose you submitted me to that ordeal.' if you propose to correct my scepticism concerning supernatural manifestations you have succeeded yes said my companion musingly they are devilishly clever but we knew that already i stared at him fatuously have you ever known me to waste my time when there was important work to do he continued do you seriously believe that my ghost hunting was undertaken for amusement really petrie although you are very fond of assuring me that i need a holiday i think the shoe is on the other foot from the pocket of his dressing-gown he took out a piece of silk fringe which had apparently been torn from a scarf and rolling it into a ball tossed it across to me smell he snapped i did as he directed and gave a great start the silk exhaled a faint perfume but its effect upon me was as though someone had cried aloud Caramina! Beyond doubt the silken fragment had belonged to the beautiful servant of Dr. Fu Manchu, to the dark-eyed, seductive Karamina. Nayland Smith was watching me keenly. "'You recognize it, yes?' I placed the piece of silk upon the table, slightly shrugging my shoulders. "'It was sufficient evidence in itself,' continued my friend, "'but I thought it better to seek confirmation, and the obvious way was to pose as the new lessee of the gables.' "'But Smith,' I began— let me explain petrie the history of the gables seemed to be susceptible of only one explanation in short it was fairly evident to me that the object of the manifestations was to ensure the place being kept empty this idea suggested another and with them both in mind i set out to make my inquiries first taking the precaution to disguise my identity to which weymouth gave me the freedom of scotland yard's fancy wardrobe i did not take the agent into my confidence but posed as a stranger who had heard the house was to be let furnished and thought it might suit his purpose my inquiries were directed to a particular end but i failed to achieve it at the time i had theories as i have said and when having paid the deposit and secured possession of the keys i was enabled to visit the place alone i was fortunate enough to obtain evidence to show that my imagination had not misled me you were very curious the other morning i recall respecting my object in borrowing a large brace and bit my object petrie was to bore a series of holes in the wainscoting of various rooms at the gables in inconspicuous positions of course but my dear smith i cried you are merely adding to my mystification he stood up and began to pace the room in his restless fashion I had cross-examined Weymouth closely regarding the phenomenon of the bell-ringing, and an exhaustive search of the premises led to the discovery that the house was in such excellent condition that, from ground-floor to attic, there was not a solitary crevice large enough to admit the passage of a mouse. I suppose I must have been staring very foolishly indeed, for Nayland Smith burst into one of his sudden laughs. "'A mouse!' I said, Petrie, he cried with a brazen bit i rectified that matter i made the holes i have mentioned and before each set a trap baited with a piece of succulent toasted cheese just open that grip the light at last was dawning upon my mental darkness and i pounced upon the grip which stood upon a chair near the window and opened it a sickly smell of cooked cheese assailed my nostrils mind your fingers cried smith some of them are still set possibly out of the grip I began to take mouse-traps. Two or three of them were still set, but in the case of the greater number the catches had slipped. Nine I took out and placed upon the table, and all were empty. In the tenth there crouched, panting, its soft furry body dank with perspiration, a little white mouse. "'Only one capture,' cried my companion, showing how well fed the creatures were. "'Examine his tail.' 
but already i had perceived that to which smith would draw my attention and the mystery of the astral bells was a mystery no longer bound to the little creature's tail close to the root with fine soft wire such as is used for making up bouquets were three tiny silver bells i looked across at my companion in speechless surprise almost childish is it not he said yet by means of this simple device the gables had been an empty of occupant after occupant there was small chance of the trick being detected for as i have said there was absolutely no aperture from roof to basement by means of which one of them could have escaped into the building then they were admitted into the wall cavities and the rafter from some cellar underneath petrie to which after a brief scamper under the floors and over the ceilings they instinctively returned for the food they were accustomed to receive and for which even had it been possible which it was not they had no occasion to forage i too stood up for excitement was growing within me i took up the piece of silk from the table where did you find this i asked my eyes upon smith's keen face in a sort of wine cellar petrie he replied under the stair there is no cellar proper to the gables at least no such cellar appears in the plans but but there is one beyond doubt yes it must be part of some older building which occupied the site before the gables was built one can only surmise that it exists although such a surmise is a fairly safe one and the entrance to the subterranean portion of the building is situated beyond doubt in the wine cellar of this we have at least two evidences the finding of the fragment of silk there and the fact that in one case at least as i learned the light was extinguished in the library unaccountably this could only have been done in one way by manipulating the main switch which is also in the wine cellar but smith i cried do you mean that fu manchu nayland smith turned in his promenade of the floor and stared into my eyes i mean that dr fu manchu has had a hiding place under the gables for an indefinite period he replied i always suspected that a man of his genius would have a second retreat prepared for him anticipating the event of the first being discovered oh i don't doubt it the place is probably extensive and i am almost certain though the point has to be confirmed that there is another entrance from the studio further along the road we know now why our recent searchings in the east end have proved futile why the house in museum street was deserted he has been lying low in this burrow at hampstead but the hand smith the luminous hand nayland smith laughed shortly your superstitious fears overcame you to such an extent petrie and i don't wonder at it the sight was a ghastly one but probably you don't remember what occurred when you struck out at that same ghostly hand i seemed to hit something that was why we ran and i think our retreat had all the appearance of a rout as i intended that it should pardon my playing upon your very natural fears old man but you could not have simulated panic half so naturally and if they had suspected that the device was discovered we might never have quitted the gables alive it was touch and go for a moment but turn out the light snapped my companion wondering greatly i did as he desired i turned out the light and in the darkness of my own study i saw a fiery fist being shaken at me threateningly the bones were distinctly visible and the luminosity of the flesh was truly ghastly turn on the light again cried smith deeply mystified i did so and my friend tossed a little electric pocket lamp on to the writing-table they used merely a small electric lamp fitted into the handle of a glass dagger he said with a sort of contempt it was very effective but the luminous hand is a phenomenon producible by any one who possesses an electric torch the gables will be watched at last petrie i think we have fu manchu in his own trap End of chapter twenty six recording by elaine tweddle sterling ontario chapter twenty seven of the return of dr fu manchu this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by elaine tweddle the return of dr fu manchu by sax romer chapter twenty seven the night of the raid dash it all petrie cried smith this is most annoying the bell was ringing furiously although midnight was long past whom could my late visitor be almost certainly this ringing portended an urgent case in other words i was not fated to take part in what i anticipated would prove to be the closing scene of the fu manchu drama every one is in bed i said ruefully and how could i possibly see a patient in this costume 
Smith and I were both arrayed in rough tweeds, and anticipating the labours before us, had dispensed with collars and wore soft mufflers. It was hard to be called upon to face a professional interview dressed thus, and having a big tweed cap pulled down over my eyes. Across the writing-table we confronted one another in dismayed silence, whilst below the bell sent up its ceaseless clangour. "'It has to be done, Smith.' i said regretfully almost certainly it means a journey and probably an absence of some hours i threw my cap upon the table and turned up my coat to hide the absence of collar and started for the door my last sight of smith showed him standing looking after me tugging at the lobe of his ear and clicking his teeth together in suppressed irritability i stumbled down the dark stairs along the hall and opened the front door Vaguely visible in the light of a street lamp which stood at no great distance away, I saw a slender man of medium height confronting me. From the shadowed face two large and luminous eyes looked out into mine. My visitor, who, despite the warmth of the evening, wore a heavy greatcoat, was an Oriental. I drew back apprehensively, then, "'Ah, Dr. Petrie,' he said, in a softly musical voice which made me start again, "'to God be all praise that I have found you.' Some emotion, which at present I could not define, was stirring within me. Where had I seen this graceful eastern youth before? Where had I heard that soft voice? "'Do you wish to see me professionally?' I asked, yet even as I put the question I seemed to know it unnecessary. "'Still you know me no more?' said the stranger, and his teeth gleamed in a slight smile. "'Heavens! I knew now what had struck that vibrant chord within me. The voice, though infinitely deeper, yet had an unmistakable resemblance to the dulcet tones of Karamina, and of Karamina whose eyes haunted my dreams, whose beauty had done much to embitter my years. The Oriental youth stepped forward with an outstretched hand. "'So you know me no more,' he repeated, "'but I know you, and give praise to Allah that I have found you.' I stepped back, pressed the electric switch, and turned with leaping heart to look into the face of my visitor. It was a face of the purest Greek beauty, a face that might have served as a model for Praxiteles. The skin had a golden pallor, which, with the crisp black hair and magnetic yet velvety eyes, suggested to my fancy that this was the young Antoninus risen from the Nile, whose wraith now appeared to me out of the night. I stifled a cry of surprise, not unmingled with gladness. It was Aziz, the brother of Karamina. Never could the entrance of a figure upon the stage of a drama have been more dramatic than the coming of Aziz upon this night of all nights. I seized the outstretched hand and drew him forward, then reclosed the door and stood before him a moment in doubt. A vaguely troubled look momentarily crossed the handsome face. With the Oriental's unerring instinct, he had detected the reserve of my greeting. Yet when I thought of the treachery of Karamina, when I remember how she whom we had befriended, whom we had rescued from the house of Fu Manchu, now had turned like the beautiful viper that she was to strike at the hand that caressed her, and I thought how to-night we were set upon raiding the place where the evil Chinese doctor lurked in hiding, were set upon the arrest of that malignant genius and all his creatures, Karamina amongst them. Is it strange that I hesitated? Yet again, when I thought of my last meeting with her, and of how twice she had risked her life to save me, so avoiding the gaze of the lad, I took his arm, and in silence we two ascended the stairs and entered my study. Where Nayland Smith stood bolt upright beside the table, his steely eyes fixed upon the face of the new arrival. No look of recognition crossed the bronzed features, and Aziz, who had started forward with outstretched hands, fell back a step and looked pathetically from me to Nayland Smith, and from the grimmer commissioner back again to me, the appeal in the velvet eyes was more than I could tolerate unmoved. "'Smith,' I said shortly, "'you remember Aziz?' Not a muscle visibly moved in Smith's face as he snapped back. "'I remember him perfectly. "'He has come, I think, to seek our assistance.' "'Yes, yes!' cried Aziz, laying his hand upon my arm with a gesture painfully reminiscent of Karamina. "'I came only to-night to London.' O oh, my gentlemen, I have searched and searched and searched until I am weary. Often I have wished to die, and then at last I come to Rangoon. To Rangoon, snapped Smith, still with the grey eyes fixed almost fiercely upon the lad's face. To Rangoon, yes. 
and there i heard news at last i hear that you have seen her have seen karamina that you are back in london he was not entirely at home with his english i know then that she must be here too i ask them everywhere and they answer yes o oh, smith pasha he stepped forward and impulsively seized both smith's hands you know where she is take me to her smith's face was a study in perplexity now in the past we had befriended the young aziz and it was hard to look upon him in the light of an enemy yet had we not equally befriended his sister and she at last smith glanced across at me where i stood just within the doorway what do you make of it petrie he said harshly personally i take it to mean that our plans have leaked out he sprang suddenly back from aziz and i saw his glance travelling rapidly over the slight figure as if in quest of concealed arms i take it to be a trap a moment he stood so regarding him and despite my well-grounded distrust of the oriental character I could have sworn that the expression of pained surprise upon the youth's face was not simulated, but real. Even Smith, I think, began to share my view, for suddenly he threw himself onto the white cane rest chair, and still fixedly regarding as is. "'Perhaps I have wronged you,' he said. "'If I have, you shall know the reason presently. Tell your own story.' There was a pathetic humidity in the velvet eyes of Aziz, eyes so like those others that were ever looking into mine in dreams. As glancing from Smith to me, he began, hands outstretched characteristically, palms upward and fingers curling, to tell in broken English the story of his search for Karamina. It was Fu Manchu, my kind gentleman. It was the Hakim, who is really not a man at all, but an ifrit. He found us again less than four days after you had left us, Smith Basha. He found us in Cairo, and to Karamina he made the forgetting of all things, even of me, even of me. Nayland Smith snapped his teeth together sharply then. What do you mean by that? he demanded. For my own part I understood well enough, remembering how the brilliant Chinese doctor once had performed such an operation as this upon poor Inspector Weymouth, how, by means of an injection of some serum prepared, as Karamina afterward told us, from the venom of a swamp adder or similar reptile, he had induced amnesia, or complete loss of memory. I felt every drop of blood recede from my cheeks. Smith, I began let him speak for himself interrupted my friend sharply they tried to take us both continued aziz still speaking in that soft melodious manner but with deep seriousness i escaped i who am swift of foot hoping to bring help he shook his head sadly but except the all-powerful who is so powerful as the hakim fu manchu i hid my gentleman and watched and waited one two three weeks at last i saw her again my sister karamina but ah she did not know me did not know me aziz her brother she was in an arabia and passed me quickly along the sharina and nazim i ran and ran and ran crying her name but although she looked back she did not know me and she did not know me I felt that I was dying, and presently I fell upon the steps of the mosque of Abu. He dropped the expressive hands wearily to his sides, and sank his chin upon his breast. And then, I said huskily, for my heart was fluttering like a captive bird, Alas, from that day to this I see her no more, my gentleman. I travel, not only in Egypt, but near and far. I see her no more until in Rangoon I hear that which brings me to England again. He extended his palms naively. And here I am, Smith Basha. Smith sprang upright again and turned to me. Either I am growing over-credulous, he said, or Aziz speaks the truth. But— he held up his hand. "'You can tell me all that at some other time, Petrie. We must take no chances. Sergeant Carter is downstairs with the cab. You might ask him to step up. He and Aziz can remain here until our return.'" End of chapter 27 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario
Chapter Twenty Eight of The Return of Doctor Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Doctor Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty Eight: The Samurai Sword. The muffled drumming of sleepless London seemed very remote from us, as side by side we crept up the narrow path to the studio. This was a starry but moonless night, and the little dingy white building with a solitary tree peeping in silhouette above the glazed roof bore an odd resemblance to one of those tombs which form a city of the dead so near to the city of feverish life on the slopes of the Mockatum Hills. This line of reflection proved unpleasant, and I dismissed it sternly from my mind. A shriek of a train whistle reached me, a sound which breaks the stillness of the most silent London night, telling of the ceaseless, febrile life of the great world capital, whose activity ceases not with the coming of darkness. Around and about us a very great stillness reigned, however, and the velvet dusk, which, with the star-jewelled sky, was strongly suggestive of an eastern night, gave up no sign to show that it masked the presence of more than twenty men. Some distance away to our right was the gables, that sinister and deserted mansion which we assumed, and with good reason, to be nothing less than the gateway to the subterranean abode of Dr. Fu Manchu. Before us was the studio, which, if Nayland Smith's deductions were accurate, concealed a second entrance to the same mysterious dwelling. As my friend, glancing cautiously all about him, inserted the key in the lock, an owl hooted dismally almost immediately above our heads. I caught my breath sharply, for it might be a signal, but looking upward I saw a great black shape float slantingly from the tree beyond the studio into the coppice on the right which hemmed in the gables. Silently the owl winged its uncanny flight into the greater darkness of the trees, and was gone. Smith opened the door, and we stepped into the studio. Our plans had been well considered, and, in accordance with these, I now moved up beside my friend, who was dimly perceptible to me in the starlight which found access through the glass roof, and pressed the catch of my electric pocket lamp. I suppose that by virtue of my self-imposed duty as chronicler of the deeds of Dr. Fu Manchu, the greatest and most evil genius whom the later centuries have produced, the man who dreamt of a universal yellow empire, I should have acquired a certain facility in describing bizarre happenings, but I confess that it fails me now as I attempt in cold English to portray my emotions when the white beam from the little lamp cut through the darkness of the studio and shone fully on the beautiful face of Karamina. Less than six feet away from me she stood, arrayed in a gauzy dress of the harem, her fingers and slim white arms laden with barbaric jewellery. The light wavered in my suddenly nerveless hand, gleaming momentarily upon bare ankles and golden anklets, upon little red leather shoes. I spoke no word, and Smith was as silent as I. Both of us, I think, were speechless rather from amazement than in obedience to the evident wishes of Fu Manchu's slave-girl. Yet I have only to close my eyes at this moment to see her as she stood, one finger raised to her lips and joining us to silence. She looked ghastly pale in the light of the lamp, but so lovely that my rebellious heart threatened already to make a fool of me. So we stood in that untidy studio, with canvases and easels heaped against the wall, and with all sorts of litter about us, a trio strangely met, and one to have amused the high gods watching through the windows of the stars. "'Go back!' came in a whisper from Karamina. I saw the red lips moving, and read a dreadful horror in the widely opened eyes, in those eyes like pools of mystery to taunt the thirsty soul. The world of realities was slipping past me. I seemed to be losing my hold on things actual. I had built up an eastern palace about myself and Karamina, wherein the world shut out. I might pass the hours in reading the mystery of those dark eyes. Nayland Smith brought me sharply to my senses. "'Steady with the light, Petrie,' he hissed in my ear. "'My scepticism has been shaken to-night, but I am taking no chances.' He moved from my side and forward toward that lovely, unreal figure which stood immediately before the model's throne and its background of plush curtains. Karamina started forward to meet him, suppressing a little cry. 
whose real anguish could not have been simulated go back go back she whispered urgently and thrust out her hands against smith's breast for god's sake go back i have risked my life to come here to-night he knows and is ready the words were spoken with passionate intensity and nayland smith hesitated to my nostrils was wafted that faint delightful perfume which since one night two years ago it had come to disturb my senses had taunted me many times as the mirage taunts the parched sahara traveller i took a step forward don't move snapped smith Karamina clutched frenziedly at the lapels of his coat. "'Listen to me,' she said, beseechingly, and stamped one little foot upon the floor. "'Listen to me. You are a clever man, but you know nothing of a woman's heart. Nothing. Nothing. If seeing me, hearing me, knowing as you do know I risk, you can doubt that I speak the truth. And I tell you that it is death to go behind those curtains, that he—' "'That's what I want to know,' snapped Smith. His voice quivered with excitement. Suddenly grasping Karamina by the waist, he lifted her and set her aside. Then, in three bounds, he was on to the model's throne and had torn the plush curtains bodily from their fastenings. How it occurred I cannot hope to make clear, for here my recollections merge into chaos. I know that Smith seemed to topple forward amid the purple billows of velvet, and his muffled cry came to me, "'Petrie! My God! Petrie!' The pale face of Karamina looked up into mine, and her hands were clutching me, but the glamour of her personality had lost its hold, for I knew, heavens, how poignantly it struck home to me, that Nayland Smith was gone to his death. What I hoped to achieve I know not, but hurling the trembling girl aside I snatched the browning pistol from my coat pocket, and with the ray of the lamp directed upon the purple mound of velvet I leaped forward. I think I realized that the curtains had masked a collapsible trap, a sheer pit of blackness, an instant before I was precipitated into it, but certainly the knowledge came too late. With the sound of a soft shuddering cry in my ears I fell, dropping lamp and pistol and clutching at the fallen hangings, but they offered me no support. My head seemed to be bursting, I could utter only a hoarse groan as I fell, fell, fell. When my mind began to work again in returning consciousness, I found it to be laden with reproach. How often in the past had we blindly hurled ourselves into just such a trap as this? Should we never learn that where Fu Manchu was, impetuosity must prove fatal? On two distinct occasions in the past we had been made the victims of this device, yet even although we had had practically conclusive evidence that this studio was used by Dr. Fu Manchu, we had relied upon its floor being as secure as that of any other studio. We had failed to sound every foot of it, ere trusting our weight to its support. There is such a divine simplicity in the English mind that one may lay one's plans with mathematical precision, and rely upon the Nalon Smiths and Dr. Petries to play their awatted parts. Excepting two faithful followers, my friends are long since departed. But here, in these vaults, which time has overworked, and which are as secret and as serviceable to-day as they were two hundred years ago, I wait patiently, with my trap set, like the spider for the fly. To the sound of that taunting voice I opened my eyes. As I did so, I strove to spring upright, only to realize that I was tied fast to a heavy ebony chair inlaid with ivory, and attached by means of two iron brackets. To the floor. Even children learn from experience, continued the unforgettable voice, alternately guttural and sibilant, but always as deliberate as though the speaker were choosing with care words which should perfectly clothe his thoughts. For a bond child fears the fire, says your English adage. But Mr. Commissioner Nawan Smith, who enjoys the confidence of the India office, who is empowered to control the movements of the criminal investigation department, learns nothing from experience. He is less than a child, since he has twice rashly precipitated himself into a chamber charged with an anaesthetic prepared by a process of my own from the lycoperdon, or common puffball. I became fully master of my senses, and I became fully alive to a stupendous fact. At last it was ended. 
we were utterly in the power of dr fu manchu our race was run i sat in a low vaulted room the roof was of ancient brickwork but the walls were draped with exquisite chinese fabric having a green ground whereupon was a design representing a grotesque procession of white peacocks a green carpet covered the floor and the whole of the furniture was of the same material as the chair to which i was strapped viz ebony inlaid with ivory this furniture was scanty there was a heavy table in one corner of the dungeonesque place on which were a number of books and papers before this table was a high-backed heavily carven chair a smaller table stood upon the right of the only visible opening a low door partially draped with beadwork curtains above which hung a silver lamp on this smaller table a stick of incense in a silver holder sent up a pencil of vapour into the air and the chamber was loaded with the sickly sweet fumes a faint haze from the incense stick hovered up under the roof in the high back chair sat dr fu manchu wearing a green robe upon which was embroidered a design the subject of which at first glance was not perceptible but which presently i made out to be a huge white peacock he wore a little cap perched upon the dome of his amazing skull and with one clawish hand resting upon the ebony of the table he sat slightly turned toward me his emotionless face a mask of incredible evil in spite of or because of the high intellect written upon it the face of dr fu manchu was more utterly repellent than any i have ever known and the green eyes eyes green as those of a cat in the darkness which sometimes burned like witch lamps and sometimes were horribly filmed like nothing human or imaginable might have mirrored not a soul but an emanation of hell incarnate in this gaunt high-shouldered body stretched flat upon the floor lay nayland smith partially stripped his arms thrown back over his head and his wrists chained to a stout iron staple attached to the wall he was fully conscious and staring intently at the chinese doctor his bare ankles also were manacled and fixed to a second chain which quivered tautly across the green carpet and passed out through the doorway being attached to something beyond the curtain and invisible to me from where i sat fu manchu was now silent i could hear smith's heavy breathing and hear my watch ticking in my pocket i suddenly realized that although my body was lashed to the ebony chair my hands and arms were free next looking dazedly about me my attention was drawn to a heavy sword which stood hilt upward against the wall within reach of my hand it was a magnificent piece of japanese workmanship a long curved damascened blade having a double-handed hilt of steel inlaid with gold and resembling fine cuffed work a host of possibilities swept through my mind then i perceived that the sword was attached to the wall by a thin steel chain some five feet in length if you had the dexterity of a mexican knife-thrower came the guttural voice of fu manchu you would be unable to witch me dear dr petrie the chinaman had read my thoughts smith turned his eyes upon me momentarily only to look away again in the same direction of fu manchu my friend's face was slightly pale beneath the tan and his jaw muscles stood out with unusual prominence by this fact alone did he reveal his knowledge that he lay at the mercy of this enemy of the white race of this inhuman being who himself knew no mercy of this man whose very genius was inspired by the cool calculated cruelty of his race of that race which to this day disposes of hundreds nay thousands of its unwanted girl-children by the simple measure of throwing them down a well specially dedicated to the purpose the weapon near your hand continued the chinaman imperturbably is a product of the civilization of our near neighbors the japanese a race to whose courage i prostrate myself in meekness it is the sword of a samurai dr petrie it is of very great age and was until an unfortunate misunderstanding with myself led to the extinction of the family a treasured possession of a noble japanese house the soft voice into which an occasional sibilance crept 
but which never rose above a cool monotone gradually was lashing me into fury and i could see the muscles moving in smith's jaws as he convulsively clenched his teeth whereby i knew that impotent he burned with a rage at least as great as mine but i did not speak and did not move the ancient tradition of seppuku continued the chinaman or harikari still rules you know in the great families of japan there is a sacred ritual that the samurai who dedicates himself to this honourable end must follow strictly the ritual as a physician the exact nature of the ceremony might possibly interest you dr petrie but a technical account of the two incisions which the sacrifant employs in his self-dismissal might on the other hand bore mr naywan smith therefore i will merely enlighten you upon one little point a minor one but interesting to the student of human nature in short even a samurai and no braver race has ever honoured the world sometimes hesitates to complete the operation the weapon near to your hand my dear dr petrie is known as the friend's sword on such occasions as we are discussing a trusty friend is given the post an honoured one of standing behind the brave man who offers himself to his gods and should the ratter's uh, courage momentarily fail him the friend with the trusty blade to which i now especially direct your attention diverts the hierophant's mind from his digression and rectifies his temporary breach of etiquette by severing the cervical vertebra of the spinal column with the friendly blade which you can reach quite easily dr petrie if you care to extend your hand some dim perceptions of the truth was beginning to creep into my mind when i say a perception of the truth i mean rather of some part of the purpose of dr fu manchu of the whole horrible truth of the scheme which had been conceived by that mighty evil man i had no glimmering but i foresaw that a frightful ordeal was before us both that i hold you in a high esteem continued fu manchu is a fact which must be apparent to you by this time but in regard to your companion i entertain very different sentiments always underlying the deliberate calm of the speaker sometimes showing itself in an unusually deep guttural and sometimes in an unusually serpentine sibilance lurked the frenzy of hatred which in the past had revealed itself occasionally in wild outbursts momentarily i expected such an outburst now but it did not come one quality possessed by mr nayland smith continued the chinaman i admire i refer to his courage i would wish that so courageous a man should seek his own end should voluntarily efface himself from the path of that world movement which he is powerless to check in short i would have him show himself a samurai always his friend you shall remain so to the end dr petrie i have arranged for this he struck lightly a little silver gong dependent from the corner of the table whereupon from the curtained doorway there entered a short thickly built burman whom i recognized for a dacoit he wore a shoddy blue suit which had been made for a much larger man but these things claimed little of my attention which automatically was directed to the load beneath which the burman laboured upon his back he carried a sort of wire box rather less than six feet long some two feet high and about two feet wide in short it was a stout framework covered with fine wire netting on the top sides and ends but being open at the bottom it seemed to be made in five sections or to contain four sliding partitions which could be raised or lowered at will these were of wood and in the bottom of each was cut a little arch the arches of the four partitions varied in size so that whereas the first was not more than five inches high the fourth opened almost to the wire roof of the box or cage and a fifth which was but little higher than the first was cut in the actual end of the contrivance so intent was i upon this device the purpose of which i was wholly unable to divine that i directed the whole of my attention upon it then as the burman paused in the doorway resting a corner of the cage upon the brilliant carpet i glanced towards fu manchu he was watching nayland smith and revealing his irregular yellow teeth the teeth of an opium smoker in the awful mirthless smile which i knew god whispered smith the six gates 
the knowledge of my beautiful country serves you well replied fu manchu gently instantly i looked to my friend and every drop of blood seemed to recede from my heart leaving it cold in my breast if i did not know the purpose of the cage obviously smith knew it all too well his pallor had grown more marked and although his grey eyes stared defiantly at the chinaman i who knew him could read a deathly horror in their depths Nadakwit, in obedience to a guttural order from dr fu manchu placed the cage upon the carpet completely covering smith's body but leaving his neck and head exposed the seared and pock-marked face set in a sort of placid leer the dacquart adjusted the sliding partitions to smith's recumbent form and i saw the purpose of the graduated arches they were intended to divide a human body in just such a fashion and as i realized were most cunningly shaped to that end the whole of smith's body lay now in the wire cage each of the five compartments whereof was shut off from its neighbour the burman stepped back and stood waiting in the doorway dr fu manchu removing his gaze from the face of my friend directed it now upon me mr commissioner naywan smith shall have the honour of acting as elephant admitting himself to the mysteries said fu manchu softly and you dr petrie shall be the friend end of chapter twenty eight recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario. Chapter twenty nine of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter twenty nine. The Six Gates. He glanced toward the Burman, who retired immediately, to re-enter a moment later carrying a curious leather sack, in shape not unlike that of a sacca or Arab water-carrier. Opening a little trap in the top of the first compartment of the cage, that is, the compartment which covered Smith's bare feet and ankles, he inserted the neck of the sack, then suddenly seized it by the bottom and shook it vigorously before my horrified gaze four huge rats came tumbling out from the bag into the cage the dacquart snatched away the sack and snapped the shutter fast a moving mist obscured my sight a mist through which i saw the green eyes of dr fu manchu fixed upon me and through which as from a great distance his voice sunk to a snake-like hiss came to my ears cantonese rats dr petrie the most ravenous in the world they have eaten nothing for nearly a week then all became blurred as though a painter with a brush steeped in red had smudged out the details of the picture for an indefinite period which seemed like many minutes yet probably was only a few seconds i saw nothing and heard nothing my sensory nerves were dulled entirely from this state i was awakened and brought back to the realities by a sound which ever afterward i was doomed to associate with that ghastly scene this was the squealing of the rats the red mist seemed to disperse at that and with frightfully intense interest i began to study the awful torture to which nayland smith was being subjected the dacquart had disappeared and fu manchu placidly was watching the four lean and hideous animals in the cage as i also turned my eyes in that direction the rats overcame their temporary fear and began you have been good enough to notice said the chinaman his voice still sunk in that sibilant whisper my partiality for dumb allies you have met my scorpions my deaf adders my baboon man the uses of such a playful little animal as a mamoset have never been fully appreciated before i think but to an indiscretion of this last name pet of mine i seem to remember that you owed something in the past dr petrie nayland smith stifled a deep groan one rapid glance i ventured at his face it was greyish hue now and dank with perspiration his gaze met mine the rats had almost ceased squealing much depends upon yourself doctor continued fu manchu slightly raising his voice i credit mr commissioner newan smith with courage high enough to sustain the raising of all the gates 
but i estimate the strength of your friendship highly also and predict that you will use the sword of the samurai certainly not later than the time when i shall raise the third gate a low shuddering sound which i cannot hope to describe but alas i can never forget broke from the lips of the tortured man in china resumed fu manchu we call this quaint fancy the six gates of joyful wisdom the first gate by which the rats are admitted is called the gate of joyous hope the second the gate of mirthful doubt the third gate is poetically named the gate of toru a rapture and the fourth the gate of a gentle sorrow i once was honoured in the friendship of an exalted mandarin who sustained the course of joyful wisdom to the raising of the fifth gate called the gate of sweet desires and the admission of the twentieth rat i estimate him almost equally with my ancestors the six or gate celestial whereby a man enters into the joy of complete understanding i have dispensed with here substituting a japanese fancy of an antiquity nearly as great and honourable the introduction of this element of speculation i count a happy thought and accordingly take pride to myself the sword petrie whispered smith i should not have recognised his voice but he spoke quite evenly and steadily i rely upon you old man to spare me the humiliation of asking mercy from that yellow fiend my mind throughout this time had been gaining a sort of dreadful clarity i had avoided looking at the sword of hari kari when my thoughts had been leading me mercilessly up to the point at which we were now arrived no vestige of anger or condemnation of the inhuman being seated in the ebony chair remained that was past of all that had gone before and of what was to come in the future i thought nothing knew nothing our long fight against the yellow group our encounters with the numberless creatures of fu manchu the dacwits even karamina were forgotten blotted out i saw nothing of the strange appointments of that subterranean chamber but face to face with the supreme moment of a lifetime i was alone with my poor friend and god the rats began squealing again they were fighting quick petrie quick man i am weakening i turned and took up the samurai sword my hands were very hot and dry but perfectly steady and i tested the edge of the heavy weapon upon my left thumbnail as quietly as one might test a razor blade it was as keen this blade of ghastly history as any razor ever wrought in sheffield i seized the graven hilt bent forward in my chair and raised the friend's sword high above my head with the heavy weapon poised there i looked into my friend's eyes they were feverishly bright but never in all my days nor upon the many beds of suffering which it had been my lot to visit had i seen an expression like that within them the raising of the first gate is always a crucial moment came the guttural voice of the chinaman although i did not see him and barely heard his words i was aware that he had stood up and was bending forward over the lower end of the cage now petrie now god bless you and good-bye from somewhere somewhere remote i heard a hoarse and animal-like cry followed by the sound of a heavy fall i can scarcely bear to write of that moment for i had actually begun the downward sweep of the great sword when that sound came a faint hope speaking of aid where i had thought no aid possible how i contrived to divert the blade i do not know to this day but i do know that its mighty sweep sheared a lock from smith's head and laid bare the scalp with the hilt in my quivering hands i saw the blade bite deeply through the carpet and floor above nayland smith's skull there buried fully two inches in the woodwork it stuck and still clutching the hilt i looked to the right and across the room i looked to the curtained doorway fu manchu with one long claw-like hand upon the top of the first gate was bending over the trap 
but his brilliant green eyes were turned in the same direction as my own upon the curtained doorway upright within it her beautiful face as pale as death but her great eyes blazing with a sort of splendid madness stood karamaneh she looked not at the tortured man not at me but fully at dr fu manchu with one hand clutched the trembling draperies now she suddenly raised the other so that the jewels on her white arm glittered in the light of the lamp above the door she held my browning pistol fu manchu sprang upright inhaling sibilantly as karamaneh pointed the pistol point-blank at his high skull and fired i saw a little red streak appear up by the neutral coloured hair under the black cap i became as a detached intelligence unlinked with the corporeal looking down upon a thing which for some reason i had never thought to witness fu manchu threw up both arms so that the sleeves of the green robe fell back to the elbows he clutched at his head and the black cap fell behind him he began to utter short guttural cries he swayed backward to the right to the left then lurched forward right across the cage there he lay writhing for a moment his baneful eyes turned up revealing the whites and the great grey rats released began leaping about the room two shot like grey streaks past the slim figure in the doorway one darted behind the chair to which i was lashed and the fourth ran all around against the wall fu manchu prostrate across the overturned cage lay still his massive head sagging downward i experienced a mental repetition of my adventure in the earlier evening i was dropping 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 into some bottomless pit warm arms were about my neck and burning kisses upon my lips end of chapter twenty nine recording by elaine tweddle sterling ontario chapter thirty of the return of dr fu manchu this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Elaine Tweddle The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer Chapter 30 The Call of the East I seemed to haul myself back out of the pit of unconsciousness by the aid of two little hands which clasped my own. I uttered a sigh that was almost a sob and opened my eyes. I was sitting in the big red leathern armchair in my own study and a lovely but truly bizarre figure in a harem dress was kneeling on the carpet at my feet, so that my first sight of the world was the sweetest sight that the world had to offer me, the dark eyes of Karamina, with tears trembling like jewels upon her lashes. I looked no further than that, heeded not if there were others in the room beside we two, but gripping the jewel-laden fingers in what must have been a cruel clasp, I searched the depths of the glorious eyes in ever-growing wonder. What change had taken place in those limpid, mysterious pools? Why was a wild madness growing up within me like a flame? Why was the old longing returned ten thousand-fold to snatch that pliant, exquisite shape to my breast? No word was spoken but the spoken words of a thousand ages could not have expressed one tithe of what was held in that silent communion. A hand was laid hesitatingly on my shoulder. I tore my gaze away from the lovely face so near to mine, and glanced up. Aziz stood at the back of my chair. "'God is all-merciful,' he said. "'My sister is restored to us.' I loved him for the plural. "'And she remembers.' Those few words were enough. I understood now that this lovely girl, who half knelt, half lay at my feet, was not the evil, perverted creature of Fu Manchu, whom we had gone out to arrest with the other vile servants of the Chinese doctor, but was the old, beloved companion of two years ago, the Karamina for whom I had sought long and wearily in Egypt, who had been swallowed up and lost to me in that land of mystery. 
The loss of memory which Fu Manchu had artificially induced was subject to the same inexplicable laws which ordinarily rule in cases of amnesia. The shock of her brave action that night had begun to effect a cure. The sight of Aziz had completed it. Inspector Weymouth was standing by the writing-table. My mind cleared rapidly now, and standing up, but without releasing the girl's hands, so that I drew her up beside me, I said, "'Weymouth, where is—' "'He's waiting to see you, doctor,' replied the inspector. A pang, almost physical, struck at my heart. "'Poor dear old Smith!' I cried, with a break in my voice. Dr. Gray, a neighbouring practitioner, appeared in the doorway at the moment that I spoke the words. "'It's all right, Petrie,' he said reassuringly. "'I think we took it in time. "'I have thoroughly cauterized the wounds, "'and granted that no complication sets in. "'He'll be on his feet again in a week or two. "'I suppose I was in a condition "'closely bordering upon the hysterical. "'At any rate, my behavior was extraordinary. "'I raised both my hands above my head. "'Thank God!' I cried at the top of my voice. "'Thank God! Thank God!' "'Thank him indeed!' responded the musical voice of aziz he spoke with all the passionate devoutness of the true moslem everything even karamaneh was forgotten and i started for the door as though my life depended upon my speed with one foot upon the landing i turned looked back and met the glance of inspector weymouth what have you done with the body i asked we haven't been able to get to it that end of the vault collapsed two minutes after we hauled you out as I write now of those strange days, already they seem remote and unreal, but where other and more dreadful memories already are grown misty, the memory of that evening in my rooms remains clear-cut and intimate. It marked a crisis in my life. During the days that immediately followed, while Smith was slowly recovering from his hurts, I made my plans deliberately. I prepared to cut myself off from old associations— prepared to exile myself gladly, how gladly I cannot hope to express in mere cold words. That my friend approved of my projects I cannot truthfully state, but his disapproval at least was not openly expressed. To Karamina I said nothing of my plans, but her complete reliance in my powers to protect her now from all harm was at once pathetic and exquisite. Since always I have sought in these chronicles to confine myself to the facts directly relating to the malignant activity of Dr. Fu Manchu, I shall abstain from burdening you with details of my private affairs. As an instrument of the Chinese doctor, it has sometimes been my duty to write of the beautiful Eastern girl. I cannot suppose that my readers have any further curiosity respecting her from the moment that fate freed her from that awful servitude. Therefore, when I shall have dealt with the episodes which marked our voyage to Egypt, I had open negotiations in regard to a practice in Cairo, I may honourably lay down my pen. These episodes opened, dramatically, upon the second night of the voyage from Marseille. End of chapter 30 Recording by Elaine Tweddle Stirling, Ontario Chapter thirty one of the Return of Doctor Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Doctor Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter thirty one. My Shadow Lies Upon You. I suppose I did not awake very readily. Following the nervous vigilance of the past six months, my tired nerves, in the enjoyment of this relaxation, were rapidly recuperating. I no longer feared to awake to find a knife at my throat, no longer dreaded the darkness as a foe. So that the voice may have been calling, indeed had been calling, for some time, and of this I had been hazily conscious before I finally awoke. Then, ere the new sense of security came to reassure me, the old sense of impending harm set my heart leaping nervously. There was always a certain physical panic attendant upon such awakening in the still of night, especially in novel surroundings. Now I sat up abruptly, clutching at the rail of my berth, and listening. There was a soft thudding on my cabin door, and a voice, low and urgent, was crying my name. Through the open porthole the moonlight streamed into my room, and, save for a remote and soothing throb inseparable from the progress of a great steamship, nothing else disturbed the stillness. 
I might have floated lonely upon the bosom of the Mediterranean. But there was the drumming on the door again and the urgent appeal. Dr. Petrie! Dr. Petrie! I threw off the bedclothes and stepped on to the floor of the cabin, fumbling hastily for my slippers. A fear that something was amiss, that some aftermath, some wraith of the dread Chinaman, was yet to come to disturb our premature peace, began to haunt me. I threw open the door. Upon the gleaming deck, blackly outlined against a wondrous sky, stood a man who wore a blue greatcoat over his pyjamas, and whose unstockinged feet were thrust into red slippers. It was Platts, the Marconi operator. "'I'm awfully sorry to disturb you, Dr. Petrie,' he said, "'and I was even less anxious to arouse your neighbour, but someone seems to be trying to get a message, presumably urgent, through to you.' "'To me?' I cried. "'I cannot make it out,' admitted Platts, running his fingers through dishevelled hair. "'But I thought it better to arouse you. Will you come up?' I turned without a word, slipped into my dressing-gown, and, with Platts, passed aft along the deserted deck. The sea was as calm as a great lake. Ahead on the port bow an angry flambeau burned redly beneath the peaceful vault of the heavens. Platts nodded absently in the direction of the weird flames. "'Stromboli,' he said. "'We shall be nearly through the straits by breakfast time.' We mounted the narrow chair to the Marconi deck. At the table sat Platts' assistant, with the Marconi attachment upon his head, an apparatus which always set me thinking of the electric chair. "'Have you got it?' demanded my companion as we entered the room. "'It's still coming through,' replied the other, without moving, "'but in the same jerky fashion. Every time I get it, it seems to have gone back to the beginning, just Dr. Petrie, Dr. Petrie.' He began to listen again for the elusive message. I turned to Platts. "'Where is it being sent from?' I asked. Platts shook his head. "'That's the mystery,' he declared. "'Look!' and he pointed to the table. According to the Marconi chart, there's a massagerie boat due west between us and Marseilles, and the homeward-bound P&O, which we passed this morning, must be getting on that way also by now. The Isis is somewhere ahead, but I've spoken to all these, and the message comes from none of them. Then it may come from Messina. It doesn't come from Messina, replied the man at the table, beginning to write rapidly. Platts stepped forward and bent over the message which the other was writing. "'Here it is,' he cried, excitedly. "'We're getting it!' Stepping in turn to the table, I leaned over between the two and read these words as the operator wrote them down. "'Dr. Petrie, my shadow.' I drew a quick breath and gripped Platts's shoulder harshly. His assistant began fingering the instrument with irritation. "'Lost it again,' he muttered. "'This message,' I began." But again the pencil was travelling over the paper. Lies upon you all. End of message. The operator stood up and unclasped the receiver from his ears. There, high above the sleeping ship's company, with the carpet of the blue Mediterranean stretched indefinitely about us, we three stood looking at one another. By virtue of a miracle of modern science, someone, divided from me by mile upon mile of boundless ocean, had spoken, and had been heard. "'Is there no means of learning,' I said, from whence this message emanated? Platts shook his head perplexedly. "'They gave no code word,' he said. "'God knows who they were. It's a strange business and a strange message. Have you any sort of idea, Dr. Petrie, respecting the identity of the sender?' I stared him hard in the face. An idea had mechanically entered my mind, but one of which I did not choose to speak, since it was opposed to human possibility. But had I not seen with my own eyes the bloody streak across his forehead, as the shot fired by Karamina entered his high skull, had I not known, so certainly as it is given to man to know, that the giant intellect was no more, the mighty will impotent, I should have replied, the message is from Dr. Fu Manchu. My reflections were rudely terminated, and my sinister thoughts given new stimulus by a loud, though muffled cry, which reached me from somewhere in the ship below. Both my companions started as violently as I, whereby I knew that the mystery of the wireless message had not been without its effect upon their minds also. But whereas they paused in doubt, I leaped from the room and almost threw myself down the ladder. It was Karamina who had uttered that cry of fear and horror. 
although i could perceive no connection betwixt the strange message and the cry in the night intuitively i linked them intuitively i knew that my fears had been well grounded that the shadow of fu manchu still lay upon us karamaneh occupied a large stateroom aft on the main deck so that i had to descend from the upper deck on which my own room was situated to the promenade deck again to the main deck and thence proceed nearly the whole length of the alleyway Karamina and her brother Aziz, who occupied a neighboring room, met me near the library. Karamina's eyes were wide with fear, her peerless coloring had fled, and she was white to the lips. Aziz, who wore a dressing-gown thrown hastily over his night attire, had his arm protectively about the girl's shoulders. "'The mummy!' she whispered tremulously. "'The mummy!' There came a sound of opening doors, and several passengers whom Karamina's cries had alarmed appeared in various stages of undress. A stewardess came running from the far end of the alleyway, and I found time to wonder at my own speed, for, starting from the distant Marconi deck, yet I had been the first to arrive upon the scene. Stacy, the ship's doctor, was quartered at no great distance from the spot, and he now joined the group. Anticipating the question which trembled upon the lips of several of those about me, "'Come to Dr. Stacy's room,' I said, taking Karamina's arm. "'We will give you something to enable you to sleep.' I turned to the group. "'My patient has had severe nerve trouble,' I explained, "'and has developed somnambulistic tendencies.' I declined the stewardess's offer of assistance with a slight shake of the head, and shortly the four of us entered the doctor's cabin on the deck above. Stacy carefully closed the door— he was an old fellow-student of mine, and already he knew much of the history of the beautiful eastern girl and her brother Aziz. "'I fear there's mischief afoot, Petrie,' he said. "'Thanks to your presence of mind, the ship's gossips need know nothing of it.' I glanced at Karamina, who, since the moment of my arrival, had never once removed her gaze from me. She remained in that state of passive fear in which I had found her, the lovely face pallid, and she stared at me fixedly in a childish, expressionless way, which made me fear that the shock to which she had been subjected, whatever its nature, had caused a relapse into that strange condition of forgetfulness from which a previous shock had aroused her. I could see Stacy shared my view, for— "'Something has frightened you,' he said gently, seating himself on the arm of Karamina's chair and patting her hand as if to reassure her. "'Tell us all about it.' For the first time since our meeting that night, the girl turned her eyes from me and glanced up at Stacy, a sudden warm blush stealing over her face and throat, and as quickly departing, to leave her even more pale than before. She grasped Stacy's hand in both her own, and looked again at me. "'Send for Mr. Nayland Smith without delay,' she said, and her sweet voice was slightly tremulous. "'He must be put on his guard.' I started up. "'Why?' I said. "'For God's sake, tell us what has happened.' Aziz, who evidently was as anxious as myself for information, and who now knelt at his sister's feet, looking at her with that strange love, which was almost adoration in his eyes, glanced back at me and nodded his head rapidly. "'Something—' Karamina paused, shuddering violently. "'Some dreadful thing, like a mummy, escaped from its tomb, came into my room to-night through the porthole.' "'Through the porthole?' echoed Stacy, amazedly. "'Yes, yes, through the porthole. A creature, tall and very, very thin. He wore wrappings, yellow wrappings, swathed about his head, so that only his eyes, his evil, gleaming eyes, were visible. From waist to knees he was covered also, but his body, his feet, and his legs were bare. "'Was he?' I began. "'He was a brown man, yes.' Karamina, divining my question, nodded, and the shimmering cloud of her wonderful hair, hastily confined, burst free and rippled about her shoulders. A gaunt, fleshless, brown man, who bent and writhed bony fingers, so— "'A thug!' I cried. "'He—it—the mummy thing would have strangled me if I had slept, for he crouched over the berth, seeking, seeking—' I clenched my teeth convulsively. But I was sitting up— With the light on, interrupted Stacy in surprise. No, added Karamina, the light was out. She turned her eyes toward me as the wonderful blush overspread her face once more. I was sitting, thinking. It all happened within a few seconds, and quite silently. 
and as the mummy crouched over the berth i unlocked the door and leaped out into the passage i think i screamed i did not mean to no oh, dr stacy there is not a moment to spare mr nayland smith must be warned immediately some horrible servant of dr fu manchu is on the ship End of chapter 31 Recording by Elaine Tweddle, Stirling, Ontario Chapter 32 of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer Chapter 32 the tragedy. Nayland Smith leaned against the edge of the dressing-table, attired in pyjamas. The little stateroom was hazy with smoke, and my friend gripped the charred briar between his teeth and watched the blue-gray clouds arising from the bowl in an abstracted way. I knew that he was thinking hard, and from the fact that he had exhibited no surprise when I had related to him the particulars of the attack upon Karamina, I judged that he had half anticipated something of the kind. Suddenly he stood up, staring at me fixedly. "'Your tact saved the situation, Petrie,' he snapped. "'It failed you momentarily, though, when you proposed to me just now that we should musker the Lascars for inspection. Our game is to pretend that we know nothing, that we believe Karamina to have had a bad dream.' "'But, Smith,' I began. "'It would be useless, Petrie,' he interrupted me. You cannot suppose that I overlook the possibility of some creature of the doctor's being among the Lascars. I can assure you that not one of them answers to the description of the midnight assailant. From the girl's account, we have to look, discarding the idea of a revivified mummy, for a man of unusual height. There's no Lascar of unusual height on board, and from the visible evidence that he entered the stateroom through the porthole, we have to look for a man more than normally thin. In a word, the servant of Dr. Fu Manchu, who attempted the life of Karamina, is either in hiding on the ship, or, if visible, is disguised. With his usual clarity of vision, Nayland Smith had visualized the facts of the case. I passed in mental survey each one of the passengers, and those of the crew whose appearance were familiar to me, with the result that I had to admit the justice of my friend's conclusions. Smith began to pace the narrow strip of carpet between the dressing-table and the door. Suddenly he began again. From our knowledge of Fu Manchu and of the group surrounding him, and don't forget surviving him, we may further assume that the wireless message was no gratuitous piece of melodrama, but that it was directed to a definite end. Let us endeavour to link up the chain a little. You occupy an upper-deck berth, so do I. Experience of the Chinaman has forced a habit in both of us, that of sleeping with closed windows. Your port was fastened, and so was my own. Karamina is quartered on the main deck, and her brother's stateroom opens into the same alleyway. Since the ship is in the Straits of Messina, and the glass is set fair, the stewards have not closed the portholes nightly at present. We know that that of Karamina's stateroom was open. Therefore, in any attempt upon our quartet, Karamina would automatically be selected for the victim, since, failing you or myself, she may be regarded as being the most obnoxious to Dr. Fu Manchu. I nodded comprehendingly. Smith's capacity for throwing the white light of reason into the darkest places often amazed me. "'You may have noticed,' he continued, "'that Karamina's room is directly below your own.' In the event of any outcry, you would be sooner upon the scene than I should, for instance, because I sleep on the opposite side of the ship. This circumstance I take to be the explanation of the wireless message, which, because of its hesitancy, a piece of ingenuity very characteristic of the group, led to your being awakened and invited up to the Marconi deck. In short, it gave the would-be assassin a better chance of escaping before your arrival." I watched my friend in growing wonder. The strange events, seemingly having no link, took their places in the drama, and became well-ordered episodes in a plot that only a criminal genius could have devised. As I studied the keen, bronzed face, I realized to the full the stupendous mental power of Dr. Fu Manchu, measuring it by the criterion of Nayland Smith's. For the cunning Chinaman, in a sense, had foiled this brilliant man before me, whereby, if by naught else, I might know him a master of his evil art. 
"'I regard the episode,' continued Smith, "'as a posthumous attempt of the doctors, a legacy of hate, "'which may prove more disastrous than any attempt made upon us by Fu Manchu in life. "'Some fiendish member of the murder group is on board the ship. "'We must, as always, meet guile with guile. "'There must be no appeal to the captain, no public examination of passengers and crew. "'One attempt has failed. I do not doubt that others will be made.' At present you will enact the role of physician in attendance upon Karamina, and will put it about for whom it may interest that a slight return of her nervous trouble is causing her to pass uneasy nights. I can safely leave this part of the case to you, I think? I nodded rapidly. I haven't troubled to make inquiries, added Smith, but I think it probable that the regulation respecting closed ports will come into operation immediately we have passed the straits, or at any rate immediately there is any likelihood of bad weather. You mean? I mean that no alteration should be made in our habits. A second attempt along similar lines is to be apprehended to-night. After that we may begin to look out for new danger. I pray we may avoid it, I said fervently. As I entered the saloon for breakfast in the morning, I was subjected to solicitous inquiries from Mrs. Pryor, the gossip of the ship. Her room adjoined Karamina's, and she had been one of the passengers aroused by the girl's cries in the night. Strictly adhering to my role, I explained that my patient was threatened with a second nervous breakdown, and was subject to vivid and disturbing dreams. One or two other inquiries I met in the same way, ere escaping to the corner table reserved to us. That iron-bound code of conduct which rules the Anglo-Indian, in the first days of the voyage, had threatened to ostracize Karamina and Aziz, by reason of the eastern blood to which their brilliant but peculiar type of beauty bore witness. Smith's attitude, however, and, in a Burmese commissioner, it constituted something of a law, had done much to break down the barriers. The extraordinary beauty of the girl had done the rest so that now, far from finding themselves shunned, the society of Karamina and her romantic-looking brother was universally courted. The last inquiry that morning respecting my interesting patient came from the Bishop of Damascus, a benevolent old gentleman whose ancestry was not wholly innocent of Oriental strains, and who sat at a table immediately behind me. As I settled down to my porridge, he turned his chair slightly and bent to my ear. "'Mrs. Pryor tells me that your charming friend was disturbed last night,' he whispered. "'She seems rather pale this morning. I sincerely trust that she is suffering no ill effect.' I swung around with a smile. Owing to my carelessness there was a slight collision, and the poor bishop, who had been invalided to England after typhoid, in order to undergo special treatment, suppressed an exclamation of pain— although his fine dark eyes gleamed kindly upon me through the pebbles of his gold-rimmed pinez. Indeed, despite his eastern blood, he might have posed for a sadler picture, his small and refined features seeming out of place above the bulky body. "'Can you forgive my clumsiness?' I began, but the bishop raised his small, slim-fingered hand of old ivory hue deprecatingly. His system was supercharged with typhoid bacilli, and, as sometimes occurs, the superfluous bugs had sought exit. He could only walk with the aid of two stout sticks, and bent very much at that. His left leg had been surgically scraped to the bone, and I appreciated the exquisite torture to which my awkwardness had subjected him. But he would entertain no apologies, pressing his inquiry respecting Karamina in the kindly manner which made him so deservedly popular on board. "'Many thanks for your solicitude,' I said. "'I have promised her sound repose to-night, and, since my professional reputation is at stake, I shall see to it that she secures it.' In short, we were in pleasant company, and the day passed happily enough and without notable event. Smith spent some considerable time with the chief officer, wandering about unfrequented parts of the ship. I learned later that he had explored the Lasker's quarters, the forecastle, the engine-room, and had even descended to the stokehold that this was done so unostentatiously that it occasioned no comment. With the approach of evening, in place of that physical contentment which usually heralds the dinner hour at sea, I experienced a fit of the seemingly causeless apprehension, which too often in the past had harbingered the coming of grim events, which I had learnt to associate with the nearing presence of one of Fu Manchu's death agents. 
in view of the facts as i afterwards knew them to be i cannot account for this yet in an unexpected manner my forebodings were realized that night i was destined to meet a sorrow surpassing any which my troubled life had known even now i experience great difficulty in relating the matters which befell in speaking of the sense of irrevocable loss which came to me briefly then at about ten minutes before the dining hour whilst all the passengers myself included were below dressing a faint cry arose from somewhere aft on the upper deck a cry which was swiftly taken up by other voices so that presently a deck steward echoed it immediately outside my own stateroom man overboard man overboard all my premonitions rallying in that one sickening moment i sprang out on the deck half dressed as i was and leaping past the boat which swung nearly opposite my door craned over the rail looking astern for a long time i could detect nothing unusual the engine-room telegraph was ringing and the motion of the screws momentarily ceased then in response to further ringing recommenced but so as to jar the whole structure of the vessel whereby i knew that the engines were reversed peering intently into the wake of the ship i was but dimly aware of the ever-growing turmoil around me of the swift mustering of a boat's crew of the shouted orders of the third officer suddenly i saw it a sight which was to haunt me for succeeding days and nights half in the streak of the wake and half out of it i perceived the sleeve of a white jacket and very near to it a soft felt hat the sleeve rose up once into clear view, seemed to describe a half-circle in the air, then sink back again into the glassy swell of the water. Only the hat remained floating upon the surface. By evidence of the white sleeve alone I might have remained unconvinced, although upon the voyage I had become familiar enough with the drill shooting jacket. But the presence of the grey felt hat was almost conclusive the man overboard was nayland smith i cannot hope writing now to convey in any words at my command a sense even remote of the utter loneliness which in that dreadful moment closed coldly down upon me to spring overboard to the rescue was a natural impulse but to have obeyed it would have been worse than quixotic in the first place the drowning man was close upon half a mile astern in the second place others had seen the hat and the white coat as clearly as i among them the third officer standing upright in the stern of the boat which with commendable promptitude had already been swung into the water the steamer was being put about describing a wide arc around the little boat dancing on the deep blue rollers of the next hour i cannot bear to write at all long as i had known him i was ignorant of my friend's powers as a swimmer but i judged that he must have been a poor one from the fact that he had sunk so rapidly in a calm sea except the hat no trace of nayland smith remained when the boat got to the spot end of chapter thirty two recording by elaine tweddle sterling Ontario. Chapter thirty three of the Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Tweddle. The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter thirty three. The Mummy dinner was out of the question that night for all of us karamina who had spoken no word but grasping my hands had looked into my eyes her own glassy with unshed tears and then stolen away to her cabin had not since reappeared seated upon my berth i stared unseeingly before me upon a changed ship a changed sea and sky upon another world the poor old bishop my neighbour had glanced in several times as he hobbled by and his spectacles were unmistakably humoured but even he had vouchsafed no word realising that my sorrow was too deep for such consolation when at last i became capable of connected thought i found myself faced by a big problem should i place the facts of the matter as i knew them to be before the captain 
or could i hope to apprehend fu manchu's servant by the method suggested by my poor friend that smith's death was an accident i did not believe for a moment it was impossible not to link it with the attempt upon karamina in my misery and doubt i determined to take counsel with dr stacy i stood up and passed out on to the deck those passengers whom i met on my way to his room regarded me in respectful silence by contrast, Stacy's attitude surprised and even annoyed me. "'I'd be prepared to stake all I possess, although it's not much,' he said, "'that this was not the work of your hidden enemy.' He blankly refused to give me his reasons for the statement, and strongly advised me to watch and wait, but to make no communication to the captain. At this hour I can look back and savour again something of the profound dejection of that time. I could not face the passengers. I even avoided Karamina and Aziz. I shut myself in my cabin and sat staring aimlessly into the growing darkness. The steward knocked once, inquiring if I needed anything, but I dismissed him abruptly. So I passed the evening and the greater part of the night. Those groups of promenaders who passed my door invariably were discussing my poor friend's tragic end but as the night wore on the deck grew empty and i sat amid a silence that in my miserable state i welcomed more than the presence of any friend saving only the one whom i should never welcome again since i had not counted the bells to this day i have only the vaguest idea respecting the time whereat the next incident occurred which it is my duty to chronicle perhaps i was on the verge of falling asleep seated there as i was at any rate i could scarcely believe myself awake when unheralded by any footsteps to indicate his coming some one who seemed to be crouching outside my stateroom slightly raised himself and peered in through the porthole which i had not troubled to close he must have been a fairly tall man to have looked in at all and although his features were indistinguishable in the darkness his outline which was clearly perceptible against the white boat beyond was unfamiliar to me he seemed to have a small and oddly swathed head and what I could make out of the gaunt neck and square shoulders in some way suggested an unnatural thinness. In short, the smudgy silhouette in the porthole was weirdly like that of a mummy. For some moments I stared at the apparition, then rousing myself from the apathy into which I had sunk, I stood up very quickly and stepped across the room. As I did so, the figure vanished, and when I threw open the door and looked out upon the deck, the deck was wholly untenanted. I realized at once that it would be useless, even had I chosen the course to seek confirmation of what I had seen from the officer on the bridge. My own berth, together with the one adjoining, that of the bishop, was not visible from the bridge. For some time I stood in my doorway, wondering in a disinterested fashion, which I now cannot explain, if the hidden enemy had revealed himself to me, or if disordered imagination had played me a trick later i was destined to know the truth of the matter but when at last i fell into a troubled sleep that night i was still in some doubt upon the point my state of mind when i awakened on the following day was indescribable i found it difficult to doubt that nayland smith would meet me on the way to the bathroom as usual with the cracked briar fuming between his teeth i felt myself almost compelled to pass around to his stateroom in order to convince myself that he was not totally there the catastrophe was still unreal to me and the world a dream world indeed i retained scarcely any recollections of the traffic of the day or of the days that followed until we reached port said two things only made any striking appeal to my dulled intelligence at that time these were the aloof attitude of dr stacy who seemed carefully to avoid me and a curious circumstance which the second officer mentioned in conversation one evening as we strolled up and down the main deck together either i was fast asleep at my post dr petrie he said or last night in the middle watch some one or something came over the side of the ship just off the bridge slipped across the deck and disappeared i stared at him wonderingly do you mean something that came up out of the sea i said nothing could very well have come up out of the sea he replied smiling slightly so that it must have come up from the deck below was it a man it looked like a man and a fairly tall one but he came and was gone like a flash and i saw no more of him up to the time i was relieved 
to tell you the truth i did not report it because i thought i must have been dozing it's a dead slow watch and the navigation on this part of the run is child's play i was on the point of telling him what i had seen myself two evenings before but for some reason i refrained from doing so although i think had i confided in him he would have abandoned the idea that what he had seen was phantasmal for the pair of us could not very well have been dreaming some malignant presence haunted the ship i could not doubt this yet i remained passive sunk in a lethargy of sorrow we were scheduled to reach port said at about eight o'clock in the evening but by reason of the delay occasioned so tragically i learned that in all probability we should not arrive earlier than midnight whilst passengers would not go ashore until the following morning Karamina, who had been staring ahead all day, seeking a first glimpse of her native land, was determined to remain up until the hour of our arrival, but after dinner a notice was posted up that we should not be in before 2 a.m. Even those passengers who were the most enthusiastic thereupon determined to postpone for a few hours their first glimpse of the land of the pharaohs, and even to forego the sight, one of the strangest and most interesting in the world, of Port Said by night. For my own part I confess that all the interest and hope with which I had looked forward to our arrival had left me, and often I detected tears in the eyes of Karamina, whereby I knew that the coldness in my heart had manifested itself even to her. I had sustained the greatest blow of my life, and not even the presence of so lovely a companion could entirely recompense me for the loss of my dearest friend. The lights of the Egyptian shore were faintly visible when the last group of stragglers on deck broke up. I had long since prevailed upon Karamina to retire, and now, utterly sick at heart, I sought my own stateroom, mechanically undressed, and turned in. It may or may not be singular that I had neglected all precautions since the night of the tragedy. I was not even conscious of a desire to visit retribution upon our hidden enemy, in some strange fashion i took it for granted that there would be no further attempts upon karamina aziz or myself i had not troubled to confirm smith's surmise respecting the closing of the portholes but i know now for a fact that whereas they had been closed from the time of our leaving the straits of messina to-night in sight of the egyptian coast the regulation was relaxed again i cannot say if this is usual but that it occurred on this ship is a fact to which i can testify a fact to which my attention was to be drawn dramatically. The night was steamingly hot, and because I welcomed the circumstance that my own port was widely opened, I reflected that those on the lower decks might be open also. A faint sense of danger stirred within me. Indeed, I sat upright and was about to spring out of my berth when that occurred which induced me to change my mind. All passengers had long since retired, and a midnight silence descended upon the ship for we were not yet close enough to port for any unusual activities to have commenced. Clearly, outlined in the open porthole, there suddenly arose that same grotesque silhouette which I had seen once before. Prompted by I know not what, I lay still and simulated heavy breathing, for it was evident to me that I must be partially visible to the watcher, so bright was the night. For ten, twenty thirty seconds he studied me in absolute silence that gaunt thing so like a mummy and with my eyes partly closed i watched him breathing heavily all the time then making no more noise than a cat he moved away across the deck and i could judge of his height by the fact that his small swathed head remained visible almost to the time that he passed to the end of the white boat which swung opposite my stateroom in a moment I slipped quietly to the floor, crossed, and peered out of the porthole, so that at last I had a clear view of the sinister mummy man. He was crouching under the bow of the boat, and attaching to the white rails below a contrivance of a kind with which I was not entirely unfamiliar. This was a thin ladder of silken rope, having bamboo rungs, with two metal hooks for attaching it to any suitable object. The one thus engaged was, as Karamina had declared, almost superhumanly thin his loins were swathed in a sort of linen garment and his head so bound about turban fashion that only his gleaming eyes remained visible 
the bare limbs and body were of a dusky yellow colour and at sight of him i experienced a sudden nausea my pistol was in my cabin trunk and to have found it in the dark without making a good deal of noise would have been impossible doubting how i should act i stood watching the man with the swathed head whilst he threw the end of the ladder over the side crept past the bow of the boat and swung his gaunt body over the rail exhibiting the agility of an ape one quick glance fore and aft he gave and then began to swarm down the ladder in which instant i knew his mission with a choking cry which forced itself unwilled from my lips i tore at the door threw it open and sprang across the deck plans i had none and since i carried no instrument wherewith to sever the ladder the murderer might indeed have carried out his design for all that i could have done to prevent him were it not that another took a hand in the game at the moment that the mummy man his head now on a level with the deck perceived me he stopped dead coincident with his stopping the crack of a pistol shot sounded from immediately beyond the boat uttering a sort of sobbing sound the creature fell then clutched with straining yellow fingers at the rails and seemingly by dint of great effort swarmed along aft some twenty feet with incredible swiftness and agility and clambered on to the deck a second shot cracked sharply and a voice god i was mad cried hold him petrie rigid with fearful astonishment i stood as out from the boat above me leaped a figure attired solely in shirt and trousers the newcomer leaped away in the wake of the mummy man who had vanished around the corner by the smoke-room over his shoulder he cried back at me the bishop's stateroom see that no one enters i clutched at my head which seemed to be fiery hot i realized in my own person the sensation of one who knows himself mad for the man who pursued the mummy was nayland smith i stood in the bishop's stateroom nayland smith his gaunt face wet with perspiration beside me handling certain odd-looking objects which littered the place and lay about amid the discardant garments of the absent cleric pneumatic pads he snapped the man was a walking ear cushion he gingerly fingered two strange rubber appliances for distending the cheeks he muttered dropping them disgustedly on the floor his hands and wrists betrayed him petrie he wore his cuff unusually long but he could not entirely hide his bony wrists to have watched him whilst remaining himself unseen was next to impossible hence my device of tossing a dummy overboard calculated to float for less than ten minutes and actually floated nearly fifteen as a matter of fact and i had some horrible moments smith i said how could you submit me he clapped his hands on my shoulder my dear old chap there was no other way believe me from that boat i could see right into his stateroom but once in i dare not leave it except late at night stealthily the second spotted me one night and i thought the game was up but evidently he didn't report it but you might have confided impossible i'll admit i nearly fell to the temptation that first night for i could see into your room as well as into his he slapped me boisterously on the back but his grey eyes were suspiciously moist dear old petrie thank god for our friends but you'd be the first to admit old man that you're a dead rotten actor your portrayal of grief for the loss of a valued chum would not have convinced a soul on board therefore i made use of stacy whose callous attitude was less remarkable gad petrie i nearly bagged our man the first night the elaborate plan marconi message to get you out of the way and so forth had miscarried and he knew the porthole trick would be useless once we got into the open sea he took a big chance he discarded his clerical guise and peeped into your room you remember but you were awake and i made no move when he slipped back to his own cabin i wanted to take him red-handed have you any idea who he is no more than where he is probably some creature of dr fu manchu specially chosen for the purpose obviously a man of culture and probably of thug ancestry i hit him in the shoulder but even then he ran like a hare we searched the ship without result he may have gone overboard and chanced the swim to shore we stepped out on to the deck around us was that unforgettable scene port said by night the ship was barely moving through the glassy water now smith took my arm and we walked forward above us was the mighty peace of egypt's sky ablaze with splendour around and about us moved the unique turmoil of the clearing-house of the near east 
"'I would give much to know the real identity of the Bishop of Damascus,' muttered Smith. He stopped abruptly, snapping his teeth together and grasping my arm as in a vice. Hard upon his words had followed the rattling clangor as the great anchor was let go, but horribly intermingled with the metallic roar there came to us such a fearful, inarticulate shrieking as to chill one's heart. The anchor plunged into the water of the harbour, the shrieking ceased. Smith turned to me, and his face was tragic in the light of the arc-lamp swung hard by. "'We shall never know,' he whispered. "'God forgive him. He must be in bloody tatters now, Petrie. The poor fool was hiding in the chain-locker.' A little hand stole into mine. I turned quickly. Karamina stood beside me. I placed my arm about her shoulders, drawing her close, and I blushed to relate that all else was forgotten. For a moment, heedless of the fearful turmoil forward, Nayland Smith stood looking at us. Then he turned, with his rare smile, and walked aft. "'Perhaps you're right, Petrie,' he said. End of chapter 33 Recording by Elaine Tweddle Stirling, Ontario End of The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer